Welcome to the final race day of event two, the 2024 F1 Sim Racing World Championship. I am so excited to get things underway. We have had a couple of days full of action and drama and different winners. And we are going to continue that trend, hopefully, into these final two races. It is all to play for as we visit Zandvoort and Austin for two races this afternoon. And I cannot wait. We're going to get straight into it. But before we do, let's just run you through the standings as they are right now. Thomas Ronhart still sitting at the top of the driver standings with 68 points with Freddy Rasmussen behind and Jarno Opmeer. Then Ishmael Farsi in fourth, Nicholas Longay P5. He'll be lining up on pole position in Zandvoort. Then we move down to Lucas Blakely, who's our pole sitter for Austin. And then we continue down the top 10 with Jake Benham rounding that out with 23 points. When we move a little bit further down the standings, Josh Edo with 19 points in 11th, followed by Jed Norgrove, Brendan Lee with 16 points, Wilson Hughes, Tom Manley, Fabrizio Donoso, Simon Vigang, and then we move to our drivers who are yet to, yet to score, starting with Patrick Schipos and moving all the way down to Danny Marino in 26th. And then if we turn our attention to the constructor standings, it is Mercedes at the top of the timesheets with 116 points. They have leapfrogged ahead of Kick F1, who sit on 84 points, tied with Oracle, Red Bull Sim Racing and the Scuderia Ferrari eSports team. McLaren and Williams are tied on 50 points in 5th and 6th. And then Haas with 27 points, Alpha Tauri with 19 and Aston Martin with 2 points. And that is how things are standing at the moment, all to play for for these next two races. Everyone, of course, very keen to get some more points on that board. But for now, it's time to do some more chatting. And I'm joined by Jonah Martins from Scuderia Ferrari. How are you feeling after today? Um, I'm really happy with the qualifying performances today. Um, Barry has been consistent as ever before. Um, I think he has the highest average qualifying position so far this event. And he's keeping it up today and uh, in the two qualifyings as well. Just missing out on pole in both races. Um, but in the end, we can be happy starting P1-2 for Zandvoort. So, um, yeah, I'm ready for the race. That is such a strong starting position there for you. Pole position for Nicholas Longate and Barry, as you said, just been consistent through this whole event. How much did it mean to see Nicholas get that pole? I think it's good for him. Um, he was struggling a little bit throughout the days. Um, he qualified decent in most races, but he just missed that little extra bit at the end to put himself in P1. And I think it's really good for his confidence going into maybe not this event, but after this event into the next five races after this. Absolutely. Such a boost. So encouraging for him. And we saw how much it meant for the team. Barry over the moon and and it's lovely to see that shared excitement through the team right it's not it's not each man for themselves you guys are in this together yeah yeah um we're feeling really strong this year we have a two driver lineup um we feel really strong with the two drivers that we have currently lined up uh, i think we can fight for the constructor championship this year so for us it's really important to get these results in and get both cars consistently up there which we've missed so far um, this event, but hopefully in Zandvoort we can change that. And looking ahead both to Zandvoort and to Austin, two races coming up, how are you feeling for both of them? Um, Zandvoort is good, we're starting 1-2, you cannot start in a better position. It's a bit tricky with the, the strategy because you cannot pit on the same lap, so we have to kind of decide what to do, but I think we have a good plan looking forward, and in Kota uh, the cars are a little bit more separated, so it makes the strategy a bit more easy. Um, but I'm looking forward to both and I hope we can score a good haul of points. Well, it's sounding promising, Jonah. Thank you so much for joining us. We wish you luck this afternoon. Claire, who have you managed to get your hands on? Come down to Mercedes and Danny Brezhne, not racing today, but uh, here at the event, obviously you were racing yesterday. Mercedes leading the championship at the moment. Ha shows how important it is to have three consistent drivers, doesn't it? Yes, uh, this event is like nothing ever before. Six races within three days and a very short preparation time of only three weeks when it was confirmed. So it's really hard for the drivers who drive all of the races and splitting our focuses can lead to better team result. And that's what we saw in the first two days. And I'm really hoping to keep up this momentum for the day. Absolutely. Let's talk us uh, through your day yesterday a little bit and then we might get on to uh, Jake's struggles during qualifying. For you, how do you feel your day went? 
Yeah, yesterday both of the qualifying sessions were hectic. Uh, from one of them, I came out as a winner because I got pole. Actually, second fastest lap, but Jarno had a three-place grid penalty. But the second qualifying session, we were both out of Q1 and then still scored 18 points in the race itself. So going to Jake, it's uh, nothing is over. Uh, they don't uh, give out points in the qualifying. Actually, they give one. <laughs> but apart from that... 46 points is possible to score as a team in the main event, so it's all about that. And uh, these 50% races, 40 minutes, there is plenty of opportunities with the strategy to make moves. Which do you think is the, the best race for Jake to kind of find himself uh, into the top 10? I think Zandvoort will be really important uh, to get the strategy right, because on that track it's really hard to overtake. And there will definitely be people who lose time behind guys who will have worse tires or worse pace. And to have the most amount of clean air running, it will be really important. Uh, but in Kota, uh, wheel to wheel action is usually, uh, it happens more. It's a wider track. Uh, there is plenty of opportunity to overtake cleanly without any like strategical uh, Hocus Pocus, or I don't know how, how you say it, Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so both tracks will be interesting, but very different. Now, I heard a really, really great fact about uh, Danny Bereshne, and that is that you competed in the Hungarian version of X Factor. You're yeah. a singer. You keep that quiet. Yes, um, I was never as talented as a driver, but uh, I find some notes. I play the guitar as well. I love singing. And if you watch F1 Esports, 2019, back, I sang You Are the Champion to David Tonitza. You may find it on YouTube. <laughs> oh, well, this, I mean, we've got to get him singing by the end of event, event three. We have to. Ariana, I feel you're down at Kick F1. Well, hey everybody, welcome to Zandvoort. We are here at the Dutch Circuit that we have witnessed racing on on three occasions. And going into second place, there's the Ferrari, Yoni Tormela. Longe goes to the front now with a 107.663. Tormela might be at risk. Butcher now, currently seventh, moves to fourth. Here comes Lucas Blakely as well. Ship pops up to fifth down for Alpine. That could be huge as now Blakely stepping up. Only P8 for Blakely, but it's all about Ferrari. One and three. Here comes Thomas Ronard though. He's gonna blunt their hearts immediately and manages to secure his place into Q3, in second place for Ronha. A truly stellar time, bouncing back after the dismay of yesterday, but we have lost some key names. Jana Watmir out again. Another champion that you've not looked at either, though, Lucas Blakely, the reigning champion, is out. Uh, qualifying went as smooth as it could have been, to be honest. Zandvoort Q2 is probably one of the tightest qualifying sessions in the whole calendar, and uh, luckily we, had, we just did a really good lap to pass the session. Uh, Barry Bruman now coming up towards the line himself. He goes fast, it's as expected, as the track continues to increase in speed. A 107. 5-1-0, Burraman still retains it. Manley can only manage second fastest. Shepos stays third. In comes Rasmussen. He joins the front row. Butcher takes him down and moves into second. But it's still Burraman out in front here in this case. we got Longe. He goes fastest. A Ferrari front row for now. But we've got Fassi, who can only stay 10th. Further down, Thomas Ronha, the last car to dance over the chicken flag line, and it's Ferrari with a front row lockout. Now, Alfie was P3, and he did the same lap time as me. But it's just Zandvoort. Zandvoort is just so tricky. Go, Barry Borman setting the exact same lap time as Alfie Butcher, but because Barry B said it first, it means that he will start tonight's race in second position, and Alfie Butcher to bounce back and be P3 on the same lap as P2 is quite bittersweet but yeah definitely happy with second row and hopefully we can uh, make either go forward in the race or stay in position. Great to have a little look back on a qualifying there and as you mentioned Claire yes I am down with kick. Samuel the Bert, lovely to have you here with us again lovely to catch up with you. How are you reflecting on the first qualifying sessions that we've had? Thomas finished P5, I think. He made a tiny mistake in the last sector, which probably cost us. Yeah, Thank sorry. You. <laughs> sorry, yeah, what, what I said. Uh, Thomas finished P5, I think. Uh, he made a tiny mistake in the in the second sector, actually, which probably cost us uh, like P2 or P3, but not much, not not the pole position. Mm -hmm. And uh, Brendan made a big mistake in his Q2 lap, which cost us uh, double Q3. So there's a lot to place in the race. So yeah, we will see what happens. 
And looking ahead, we've got both Zandvoort and Austin coming up. Let's start with Zandvoort. How are you feeling approaching that one? It's it's a short circuit, but lots to play for, but tricky to yeah. overtake. Yeah, it's nearly impossible to overtake, to be honest. Uh, so we're going to see what we can do with the strategy. Um, the goal is to yeah, do, score double points with the teams, with both drivers. It's going to be really hard with Brandon because he's starting from P15, but yeah. we're going to try something different. Obviously, cannot tell you what now. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're going to try something different and see if we can finish in the point with him. And uh, with Thomas, yeah, we, we, we'll see what we can do with him. But definitely, if I, I am for top five. And top five, that's, that's very good. And yeah. what about um, Austin? Because that one, you've got better starting positions, more to play for. How encouraged are you? Where do you think you can get to in that one? Kota is a, yeah, it's a big, big track, mm. uh, long straight. We actually did a pretty good job in the quality this time. P5 in uh, P7. So, yeah, it's going to be pretty interesting to see what the other are going to do in the strategy because there is a lot of uh, different strategy on that track. And, um, yeah, I think uh, we'll be there as well with the strategy that we have. Okay, not saying much about that strategy, but it sounds like yeah. you've got something up your sleeve there. Um, how have you found the last few days? It's been quite full on, six races, six yeah. qualifying events in a short period of time. Uh, what's it been like from a team's perspective? Um, it, yeah, as you said, it's really tricky to do three days in a row in that kind of uh, environment. Uh, six races in three days, it's uh, a lot for the drivers. Uh, there's a lot of emotions, as you saw yesterday. Yeah. Uh, a lot of uh, tension as well. So, But I think we managed it pretty well. Uh, the first day was amazing for us. Yeah. Uh, the second day a bit less, but uh, you cannot win every time. And uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So we will be back stronger today in the in the event three as well. So yeah. Absolutely, and the highs and lows are the beauty of our sport. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. us. Good luck for Thank these you. races. I think it's just about time that we get things underway. We venture across the North Sea coastline, settling within the Dutch dunes of Zandvoort. Welcome everybody to the Formula One Sim Racing World Championship and its very own Dutch Grand Prix. Formerly a street circuit holding its first race in 1939, it would later establish its mainstay as a purpose-built circuit designed under the watchful eye of 1927 Le Mans winner Sammy Davis, ready for its first Grand Prix on August 7th, 1948. In recent years, three times we've gone racing here in the Formula One Sim Racing World Championship with three different race winners that include the great Freddie Rasmussen, Danny Moreno and Lucas Blakely. Of course, around a circuit such as this, with many trying corners, plenty of DRS detection zones to be concerned about, one being down the very long main straight, which takes you into the speed trap, which will then light things up heading through the main hairpin. 14 corners for the drivers to undertake, a roller coaster of sorts, with banking to dare to watch out for. It's certainly going to be a special encounter. Many drivers from back to front looking to make places, big points on the table. We have five race winners so far this campaign. Could it be six, or will we see someone finally get their second? Here's the starting grid. Alvaro Caraton in 20th place at the back of the grid with Yulas Odjildarim in 19th spot. Further up in 18th place, it's John Evans with Ruben Pedreño in 17th. Next up in 16th, it's Jake Benham, the All-Star, looking to try and rise up with Brendan Lee, the two-time champion, alongside him in 15th. In 14th place is Patrick Schipos with Fabrizio Donoso Delgado in 13th place. 12th spot goes to Jano Otmir, bidding to try and obtain yet another race win this season. Yoni Tormela alongside him, just outside the top 10, starts 11th. Ishmael Fassi in 10th, with Lucas Blakely in 9th spot for McLaren. 
Up in eighth spot now, too, is McLaren teammate Danny Moreno, former race winner here, Tom Manley in seventh for Alpha Tauri. In sixth is Freddie Rasmussen, also a former race winner. He starts sixth with Thomas Ronha alongside him in fifth. Second row of the grid is Josh Edo in fourth, with Alfie Butcher, the last season's F1 Esports Challenges champion, starting in third place. On the front row, however, it's Ferrari dominant. Barry Burrowman starts second, pole position, going to the Frenchman, Nicolas Longuet. And folks, I have to tell you, we're going to be witnessing certainly a gargantuan fight, a mega fight of sorts. Here to take you through the race at Zandvoort, your commentators, me and myself, George Morgan. Joining me, as always, is Hayden Gallis. Thank you very much, George. Always a pleasure to be commentating alongside yourself. We're going to get a great race here today at Zandvoort. Both Ferrari boys leading the way from the front, as you alluded to there. Five different race winners within the first five races from five different teams as well. Could it be a sixth? Well, we've got Nicholas Longe yet to win a race this season. On pole position, he'll be looking to get across the line to be our sixth different race winner. But if it's going to come from a different team, we're going to be looking further down the grid. The, the Red Bull drivers getting themselves ready there. Frederick Rasmussen and Josh Edo. Good qualifying sessions for both of those guys. Josh Edo in fourth position with Freddie Rasmussen uh, sixth place. Out qualified by his teammate. There's the two kick, uh, kick F1 team uh, drivers there with a little fist pump. Getting ready for this race at Zambor. Yeah, you can just feel, you can cut the tension with the knife here in the arena. We were just panning cameras across. You can now see Thomas Ronha in the distance. And we do apparently have rainfall uh, now presenting itself across the circuit of Zandvoort. And it's torrential, as far as we understand too. A wry smile on the face of Lucas Blakely. Might actually get a bout of confidence from this. Certain drivers might like this approach. He'll be happy because last time we had a wet session at Zanvoort, a 2022 season, this guy absolutely dominated. It was from a better position on the starting grid, but who knows what could happen for Lucas Blakely in this race. We're going to be starting off with uh, full wet conditions. But it's going to be interesting to see how the strategy plays out across the rest of the field. We have seen it in the past where some drivers opt for the intermediate tyres to better themselves later on in the race, whereas others go for the wet to guarantee a fantastic start off the line. Yeah, certainly McLaren will favour the chances in this one, having two former race winners here in this very race. Of course, Danny Moreno winning in 2021, with Lucas Blakely winning in his bid to become world champion last season. Yoni Tormala, as well as teammate uh, alongside him, Tom Manley, as I alluded to, former uh, F1 Esports Challenges champion on the Xbox Pro, Pro um, uh, program, should I say, and we have Fabrizio Donoso Delgado for Aston Martin alongside John Evans, who is finding decent improvements all the time, which is great to see Donoso also improving as we make our way through the championship. Almost vintage Donoso in place as the Chilean looking to come back with a last gasp attack as we now await to go racing. Of course, it's all about Ferrari at the front of the field. How about that, Hayden? A lockout from one, P's one, P's two, it's Ferrari bound. Yeah, I'm just trying to get a little eye in on the strategies going around on people's screens at the moment, and they are undecided. They've got it set up ready in case at the last minute, whether they want to decide to go for intermediate tires or of course wets for the start. But both are options. Look at the rain falling in the background there in the studio, of course. The rain is absolutely chucking it down. It is definitely full wet conditions, but the intermediates can last very well. And here come the lights, folks, as we get set to race. Here at Zanford, all five lights are lit, and it's pedal to the metal. And it is go, 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 go. Nicholas Longay gets the way well. Barry Burman covers in behind, trying to prevent Alfie Butcher going in on the attack. The spray being kicked up as they make their way through turn one. The bank corners are coming up, but first, a slight slalom heading uphill. And look for the back, Ron Haranino going at it. The Red Bull hanging it around the outside, much like his teammate, Freddie Rasmussen, who's now trying to fight against Alfa Harry driver Tom Manley, Butcher though, beating down Josh Edo, holds on to third place with Manley displacing Freddie Rasmussen. Those two drivers came together yesterday at Spa, Josh Edo and Thomas Ronha, but they get through cleanly and it is Josh Edo who gets the upper hand in P4. P5 for Thomas Ronha and I can tell you every single driver on track right now is on the intermediate tyres, so it's going to be very difficult in this opening phase to make sure you do not make a mistake in these conditions because the tyres won't quite be performing to their best at the moment as yellow flag out there on track. A driver is falling, not too sure whether that's John Evans. There's a slight position change for him, but it looks like we're all underway. Dropping at the back of the field, it looks like it was actually Jake Benham and Patrick Sheepos, sadly, as we're watching Yoni Tomala and Ismail Fassi go wheel to wheel. Yeah, 
every car on intermediate tyres. Now, we are in what, we, what they would call stormy weather. Uh, mm -hmm. It could yet become intermediates wet. We don't know. They might transition this strategy. We might yet chuck off the intermediate tyres, maybe embrace the wet as time goes on. It all comes down to what the drivers are feeling right now. Longay is a, just at a 125.9. And uh, as I understand it, we will be getting a restart, apparently. That's confirmation from race control uh, due to a grid error that we have had on circuit. So we will keep you updated, folks, as we await the drivers to settle down. A little you bit think, of a test run for some yeah, of us. Yeah, just take a breather now. You can just relax, <laughs> take a little breather at the moment. And uh, they were just teasing us for what's to come. So we're going to be reloading into the lobby. It'll be interesting to know whether we go back to the same sort of conditions That's or whether question. we're going to be getting different conditions in this race. For me, I hope that we get the same conditions because the wet does throw in that element that kind of equalizes the whole field. They'll be disappointed, the Red Bull drivers, because they were having a strong performance uh, at the start of the race. Of course, both Ferrari drivers will be disappointed as well, especially if the second race restart falls away from them. But now they've done it so smartly in the first one, they need to do that again. They need to get themselves in the right mindset for the second race restart. Yeah, of course, this circuit, 2.646 uh, miles, uh, 4.259 kilometers. Just uh, Red Bull uh, getting caught up with everything that's happening out on track. Brendan Lee uh, obviously finding it humorous as well and uh, having a little chuckle to himself. Uh, great to see Brendan in high spirits here, as well as his teammate Thomas Ronha. They've got a lot of work to do, however. I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't stay smiling, Brendan. Still a, a little bit more to do. That's <laughs> intense, isn't he? Uh, but yes, uh, there is Ruben Pedreño, uh, Patrick Shipos. They've got a chance as well to try and rise up the order. Shipos himself starting, or at least for now, he's down in 18th place off the back of that, rest uh, off the back of that initial race start. Um, so we'll have to wait and see how he does when we get back underway very, very soon. Williams be hoping for a much improved restart as well. Uh, but yeah, obviously, like you said, Ferrari aren't going to be 100% behind this because obviously, <laughs> given the fact that, you know, Longay covered the, the lead off very well and his teammate Barry Burraman providing exceptional covering behind. Yeah, I mean, I saw when they were giving the notification to the drivers, obviously they've got the headset on. They can't really hear what's going on in the studio uh, for the for the uh, race directors to say, all right, guys, we need to halt it there, come out of the session, restart it, get in the next one. Got a tap on the shoulder and they're like, what's, what's this for? What, why? Why is this happening? Because of course, you know, fantastically off the line. One and two, Nicholas Longe got away from his teammates slightly and uh, they were having a, having a great start. Brendan Lee's just chatting away, of course. Brendan Lee, is never going to stop talking. He's always talking. Look at that smile on his face. You know, you can't you can't keep him quiet. He doesn't care really too much about these uh, about these race restarts. He's always he's always in the in the groove, ready to go when the race gets underway once again. He's super duper calm, and I suppose that just comes from so much experience that Brendan Lee has. One of the most experienced drivers on the grid at the moment. He's given us the eyes, though. He's uh, telling us to watch out, is uh, Brendan Lee. He's going to think we're picking on us. Yeah, he, I, he's going to be after our jobs in a minute, George. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be outrageous. Uh, the driver's now getting set as the new lobby will be created and we'll get set to go racing again uh, for the restart of this Dutch Grand Prix race. Uh, but yes, I mean, naturally, it was quite a fraught start. Freddie Rasmussen um, tried to go wheel to wheel with Tom Manley. Manley did an exceptional job of hanging on uh, to his position. It was a very, very tight fight, and it actually carried on right through the first sector, through towards sector two as well. Extremely um, intense battling and sheer bottle from both drivers to be able to hold on the way they did because there is some very tricky corners around this track. Yes, yeah, certainly, especially in the wet conditions because, you know, all it takes is one slight error and you're going to be off into the grass. There's not really massive runoff area around this circuit. It's, it's gravel and grass, so one error and you're out there. Uh, I can tell you that it was Ishmael Fassi who was out of position. He did get a, a grid penalty uh, coming into this race as well, a free place grid penalty, uh, all because of um, a little bit of um, uh, obstruction for Patrick Shipos out on track. So Ishmael Fassi had a free place grid penalty, and unfortunately, though, in the wrong position uh, when they set up the lobby. There is Woody. He is currently ready for today's Race. Of course, Nicholas Longay's mascot that he brings to every single one of his races, hopefully going to be giving him the luck and uh, lassoing him to glory in today's race. <laughs> Very nicely put, Hayden Gallis. Hopefully there won't be a snake in his boot. Fingers <laughs> crossed. We'll wait and see. Uh, would be a bit of a risky business when applying it on the brake pedal, but we'll wait and see. Uh, obviously, there's Jonah Martins in the background representing the Ferrari lineup as we get set to... Uh, 
well, get going for a restart. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is where the engineers almost have to reset themselves as yeah, well. They would have come yeah. into this with different data, and if indeed the conditions do vary, then we could be in for a, a bit of change of perspective, I suppose, yeah. when looking ahead to this race. So you can just see them now buried in amongst the data, in amongst their laptops, just trying to hit the reset button in their own minds mm -hmm. so they can go racing again. Well, they've done enough preparation behind the scenes to have a scenario for each individual weather condition that could be brought to us across the rest of this race, of course. So, you know, they're going to be prepared. They're going to be ready. But when you drop into that session, you need to quickly assess, OK, how quickly is the rain going to clear up? Is it going to be there for a while? Is it going to be intermediate conditions? Is it going to be full wet conditions? Are we going to go to dries quite quickly? Is it going to take a while? So that's the stuff they're going to have to be assessing. But they have such a short period of time. As soon as they load up into the lobby, that's when they'll be able to find out. And we'll be able to find out whether we will be getting wet weather conditions again. Yep, sit tight, everybody, as we now pan across and take a look at Haas. And uh, they'll be looking, hopefully, for a decent run. Back attacks on the right-hand side. The team manager for the Haas uh, racing team. And I'm just seeing now, uh, by the looks of it, if I'm not mistaken, is that wet weather tyres? Yeah, seeing it is wet on weather tyres. So it's stormy wet conditions weather again. Tires. I'm, I'm seeing some of the drivers uh, having that applied to their strategy. So by the looks of it, stormy weather conditions will continue for the restart mm -hmm. here of this Dutch Grand Prix race. Uh, bizarre circumstances. Obviously, some of the drivers may be feeling a little fraught by all this, but this is vastly different to what we had before because initially we were on intermediate rubber and there are some concerns being raised here by some team members who are ushering towards the technical crews just to get an insight perhaps as to you know, why this necessary change yeah, yeah. or perhaps they were hoping for intermediates instead of wet. It's a mystery. Yeah, certainly. I've just been quickly looking over the driver's screens and they have lots of different blocks that dedicates what the weather is going to be doing. It's going to be going from full wet conditions for two blocks, then into stormy conditions. So it's going to be getting wetter before drying up towards the end of the race. So you can run that risk. You can go for intermediate tyres early on, but then it's going to get far too wet in the middle stage of the race that you're not really going to be benefiting from it. All the drivers running up now, and they're going to have another restart in about four minutes, we hear. So uh, we're going to get another lobby underway, George. Uh, so they just get this moment to relax once again. Maybe a bit of a practice restart for them again. Yeah, they might need to uh, relax at this stage because, of course, we now have got, we've got another restart procedure in hand, but uh, it has to be said, some moments that I'm sure Ferrari can do without because obviously it could uh, effectively head into the mind. Again, a test of mental fortitude for various different reasons, similar to what you get uh, in a sense of real life where things don't quite go to plan. Maybe the setup isn't correct or something like that. This is the situation we face where it comes to the sim racing world. And naturally, these are what the, the teams and the drivers have to battle against. And again, a test of strength. And like I said, a test of mental fortitude. There's Red Bull and there's John Evans, of course, debutant last season, coming back in this time for this campaign and has scored points in, in this campaign as well as done superbly well to do so. And uh, now chasing uh, a little extra, of course, but he's got a lot of work to do from 15th place. Brendan Lee just had a little bit of a collision there in this practice race that they're currently doing. So I'll be hoping that that does not happen when we get underway for the real one. Uh, but the drivers now uh, restarting for the lobby. We'll be, get, be getting underway shortly. The Ferrari drivers not happy because, again, those guys are at the front. They are doing exactly what they need to do at the moment to stay at the front. And this is not helping them because every time that there's a restart for those guys, they have to get themselves back into the groove, back into the moment and try and really push for the start of this race to stay one, two for those two. Absolutely right. Well, what I can tell you, folks, is that we can throw it across to Claire Cottingham, who is just observing here in the arena. Indeed, the atmosphere completely changed when the game restarted. All of the drivers started turning their heads around, looking around, and I couldn't quite work out what was happening. And I went to go speak to the guys at Haas, and they said the game conditions were different from what they expected it to be. So that's why we're getting this uh, another restart happening now. Uh, the drivers, I'm assuming, will be happier with this, but again, it's, it's very important for them for the conditions to be exactly what they were predicting. Very much, Claire. 
uh, for that insight there. And it does seem to be the case that uh, it wasn't necessarily the correct conditions that uh, were meant to be in place for the second restart. So now they're in the process of correcting that now. But uh, nonetheless, the drivers have to get themselves reset, recomposed. Again, as we say, an imperative race for many could yet decide maybe a driver going into this season, a two-time race winner, as opposed to adding a six different race winner. But either way, mm -hmm. it's definitely going to be exciting. There we can see in the background, the Red Bull team getting set and ready to go. Andre Kunschman there in behind, trying to aid his team. Of course, Josh Edo and Freddy Rasmussen. Rasmussen, one of the most uh, <laughs> consistent performers. He just walked past me now as they get set for the restart. And uh, we will be seeing him hit the track now <laughs> very shortly. But obviously having chats with his team, um, just getting a chance to obviously get himself reset. And uh, naturally, as he sits down in his rig, getting ready to go again. And there is Goku, who makes an appearance here in the F1 Sim Racing World Championship as well, Hayden. Yeah, Freddy Rasmussen just trying to make himself a little bit lighter before going into uh, this race with a quick little toilet break, uh, utilizing that race restart to uh, get himself sorted for the race. They're all back in the rigs. They're all ready to go. We should be getting this lobby underway very, very shortly. And this is going to be interesting to see how this plays out. You speak about maybe someone could become a two-time race winner for the first time this season. Barry Borman's probably got the best chance starting the race in P2. Alfie Butcher, though, just behind him. P3. And those guys said exactly the same lap times in qualifying. Josh Edu, though, will be hoping to get off the mark and trying to get his first win, of course, of the season as well. He's starting in P4 and we'll have a great opportunity for that. Certainly will. And uh, Ferrari will be looking to continue as they started. But um, you just see there, just maybe a little stress. The tension starting to heighten now. Uh, sitting upright in their seat and um, Nicholas Longay trying to get himself recomposed. They don't really want to carry on waiting. Uh, it, it's like standing on the grid as far <laughs> as they're concerned. So they would much rather be underway, I'm sure. But it won't be long before we get underway, folks. In the next couple of minutes, we will be going racing as they now get set ready to go and uh, i can just see just look behind me nicholas longay just having a little look outside of his cockpit further up williams also getting set Caraton back again and uh, looking to try and find that rich vein of form that we have seen in years gone by since 2018 where he would join the williams team Further up, Brendan Lee, as well as Thomas Ronha, who are going to be looking for a big result too. And you, Lasha Gildren, what about Alfie Butcher? Is he going to pull off something truly tremendous this time? Needs to in this instance, but uh, never count him out. He's got to try and break ahead of the two Ferraris in front of him as they now get set. And I'm sure very soon we'll head down to the track. In terms of what you see at the moment, Hayden, I see you now scanning yep. around and having a look at some of the rigs the drivers currently sat within them. What are you gauging here? Yeah, just having a look at what the weather's doing on the driver's screen. And the blocks are saying that it's going to be light rain to start the race off with. About halfway through the race, we're going to be drying up into dry conditions. So we're going to have some great battling right at the end of the race. But it's going to be all about trying to keep it on the track in the starting phase. Intermediate tyres should be the tyre of choice. I doubt anybody will be going on the wet tyres. If they do, they're just going to be losing a lot of time out there. So intermediate tyres for all of the drivers out there on track in these light rain conditions. Yeah, I think they'll be glad that this track is no longer a street circuit like it used to be. Now, of course, that purpose-built circuit that I alluded to at the top of this show. But now as we get set to go racing here, you can see there the weather still chucking the rain down at this point. But many of the drivers occupying the intermediate tyres as now we have all the lights lit here at Zandvoort. And for the second time, we put pedal to the metal. And it is go, 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 go. Nicholas Longay once again pounces to the front, almost a carbon copy of the original race before. Alfie Butcher still in third place. Josh Edo on the attack, as he did previously as well. So still some trend on offer here. Rasmussen once again trying to pounce on Tom Manley as they come through the first bank corner here. Longay in control. Danny Moreno under threat. Yoni Tormler had a great start. Yeah, all very well behaved this time around compared to the first race start because they're all going single file at the moment but the Ferraris knew exactly what they were doing they discussed that behind the scenes after qualifying we know exactly what we're doing Longay goes Barry stops in behind them and we carry it on from there we look further down the field Danny Moreno in P10 he's trying to defend off Fabrizio Donoso who is in 11th position in this race at the moment further down the field Alvaro Caraton in P20 Ulas and John Evans having a little battle back there as they go wheel to wheel to Gianna Watmir and Ishmael Fassi yeah, Jano Watmir now going wheel-to-wheel -wheel with Fasti heading down the long straight. Usually he would have DRS here, but uh, despite it 
uh, well, despite the case that it would probably arrive in lap three, should have we had dry conditions, it won't appear under the wet. Fassi now under pressure from Patrick Shepost as well in behind. Fassi doesn't want to lose too many places here. Otmir, of course, holding on to that 12 spot, chasing after Fabrizio Donoso, Delgado in other areas as well. In the mid top 10, Tom Manley and Freddy Rasmussen once again manacled together, but the gaps are fairly equal throughout the order. Now, as we see a few of them fanning out, heading in towards turn one, some of them might even try something a little risky. Heading through that first sector in Otmir, I think, might be trying that. Further down, I think it might actually be Jake Benham as well on the attack. There is Otmir Donoso with a very, very late lunge here on Danny Moreno as they now make their way out to the bank corner now and looking to run wheel to wheel, heading through down the downward slope before then reaching the middle sector, Donoso on the attack. Very aggressive there from Fabrizio Donoso. Lucky to not lose any front wing end place. Just sticking his nose on the inside of the curvature at that hairpin. But Fabrizio Donoso slots in to P11. It's going to be interesting to see how the strategy plays out and the setups that the drivers are going to be using for this race. Of course, they're in wet conditions now, but full focus surely has to be on what is happening later on in the race. It's going to dry up halfway through, probably at around lap 18 in this race. As, uh, what are you pointing at, George? Well, I'm looking at a 1.2 second gap between the two Ferraris right at the yeah. very top. So Longay pushing onwards. Barry Burman holding up the field, do you think? Yes, yeah, certainly. This is going to be great teamwork for the Ferrari. Let Longay run away with it and kind of guarantee yourself a race win. We saw the massive gap that Lucas Blakely had in 2022 over the rest of the field are they looking to replicate something like that here today Longay running away from everyone or does he have more of an intermediate setup on the car which could restrict him later on as they go into the drives we saw that in 2022 with Jano Otmir he went onto the drives and really struggled had to go onto the hard tires at the end of that race because his tire pressures were far too high but Josh Edo currently there in fourth position as wheel to wheel goes Jake Benham and Brendan Lee yeah Jake Benham now trying to make his way through the bank corner and uh, was looking for a move on Brendan Lee at the very head of the order now the gap is increasing to nearly 1.5 seconds Alfie Butcher did try to make the move heading in towards turn one but Barry Burman covered it off in truly brilliant fashion and is still trying Trying to do the teammate favours here at this point. He still needs to try and maintain at least some of the pace in order to allow this to work. He can't allow anyone to burst through into second to try and hunt down Longay because otherwise the strategy is mitigated. Certainly so. Alfie Butcher, he's kind of in two minds at the moment, wants to get the move done, wants to get past Barry Borman to go hunt down the race leader. But at the same time, if you go for it this early on and you don't get it quite correct, you could lose out on battery. You could open the door for somebody else to just snatch away your position. So he has to be smart if he wants to go for it but the gap's staying at around 1.4 at the moment and you can kind of understand it because Ferrari are 1-2 in this race if they're so close to each other when the crossover phase happens we go to the dry tyres they're gonna have to double stack they're gonna lose time so Barry needs to build that gap to make sure that they don't lose time in the pit stop phase and both of them retain that one too yeah absolutely right indeed so this could be a brilliant plan on the table here for Ferrari. We did allude to what a potential one, two, or even a double podium could lead to. Of course, we saw what it did for Mercedes in terms of the team's championship. Ferrari hoping for the same ambitions themselves as we now witness Thomas Ronnar in his home race here at Zandvoort, just trying to hunt down after Josh Edo for that fourth spot. The kick F1 car now making its way through that middle sector as they now curtail through this next right-hander. He's plugged right into the back of Edo and the Welshman has got to do everything he can to try and hold on to this position but it's going to come under great scrutiny and great stress as Ronha continues to follow him and tread water here heading through down towards the chicane. Yeah, Ronha will be looking to bounce back after last night's race at Spa. It was a disappointment for him but currently running in P5 but these two were battling last night and that's where it all started with these two coming together in that race. Thomas Ronhard, though, has to be patient. There's no need to stick one up the inside, have the driver ahead, close the door on you, front wing gone, and it's race over, and he's going to be pretty much like the same, you know, emotions as he had at the end of last night's race in Spa. So Thomas Ronhard just holding rank at the moment, and, it, you know, we're in this big train at the moment because overtaking is difficult in these wetter conditions as Freddie Rasmussen just fills up the mirrors of Tom Manley but, uh, ahead of him, just says, by the way, mate, I am behind you. Uh, if you make a mistake, I will be pouncing on that and I will be taking away your position. No need for an overtake just yet, though, as Thomas Ronha is still the sole focus of what we're looking at at the moment in this race. We switch back, though, to Jano Otmir looking to try and work his way through the field. Yeah, trying to close up to Fabrizio De Noso. Delgado in front. Now, that gap has come down a little bit. Remember, of course, Otmir overtaking Fasti, then had to put the work in to retain a close margin on Donoso for that 11th place. 
Uh, only two places away, Jarno, from getting into the top 10 and therefore being in the points-paying position. So you can imagine there are plenty of cars further back that would love to be in that place. Williams, obviously, as well themselves, looking to try and get at least one of the cars, or if they could, get both cars. But Caraton with a lot of work to do from P19 here at this point as they now make their way down through towards turn 11 and turn 12 before then executing around the final two corners around the circuit of Zandvoort. Of course, the bank corners that have lit up this track fairly can derail your race as well if you're not balanced enough. This curve specifically can really send you into obscurity. We've seen many cars in the past take the gravel and unfortunately sometimes even beckon their way into the barrier. Jana Watmir chasing after Denoso. The gap you can see at the bottom, three tenths and closing. So the little elements of slipstream working to a certain degree. Obviously, they've got no DRS, so they can't use it amidst these conditions. We saw in the background as well, Brendan Lee just breaking outside of Patrick Sheepos ahead of him. Yeah, he was trying to have a little look around the outside of turn one, trying to make his way up through the order in this race. Look at the gaps between everybody. Everyone's separated by less than really half a second apart from one driver, and that's Nicholas Longay right up at the front. The gap now two seconds between those two. I think Barry Broman's going to have to build it up ever so slightly, just a bit more. You can get unlucky sometimes with the double stack in that you can leave about a two second gap and it's still fine. It's up the inside though, goes Brendan Lee. He was having a look through turn one, but it looks like he's got the manoeuvre done in towards that section of corners. And Brendan Lee moves up to 14, but back comes Patrick Sipos up the inside. Oh. It was very desperate there from the Alpine driver and he got over rotated and he moves down into 15 position. Brendan Lee unsettled slightly. The gap has formed now to just over one second. He's going to have to reel that back in to make sure he doesn't lose the car ahead and they can all stay in this train. But looking back at the front, yeah, they're going to have to build that gap just a little bit more to make sure they don't lose any time. Yeah, double vicious, stacking. vicious intent from Sheepass earlier on. We saw him do the switchback. Very nearly pulled it off, heading through box 10, but could not quite achieve it as they now retain that orderly fashion. Freddie Rasmussen now trying to attack Tom Manley as they now look to go wheel to wheel for P6. Rasmussen finally breaking away from Manley who drops down to seventh place. Sheepass now Jake Benham dropping down two places as now he falls behind John Evans uh, heading through the initial sector. I think, to be honest with you, I think Benham might have tried something a little zealous coming through the first sector and has unfortunately had to forego the places. John Evans now at 16th. Yeah, Jake Benham, I was looking at him whilst it was going on. Very strong words over there from the Mercedes garage. And uh, I'm not too sure he was happy with what was going on between himself and Patrick Sipos. We'll have to wait a replay to really have a look at what happened between those two drivers and see who potentially was at fault for that one. But Thomas Ronha still in the front in this train that is building up behind Barry Borman, who's doing a fantastic job, you must say. So it's, it's so difficult when you're trying to slow down the pack to stay ahead of them. Of course, you've just got to keep your car in the middle of the track, but it's so easy for a driver just to try and, you know, get a little bit frustrated, a little bit impatient and go for that overtake. But that hasn't happened yet. Barry is pushing away from the field where he needs to, but holding them up in the correct places as well. And this gap is forming. 2.3 seconds now between Nicholas Longay and Barry Boromond. Behind them, then you've got Alfie Butcher, still on the podium. He's had a strong performance so far in the F1 Sim Racing season. Uh, some great qualifying sessions. The races have fallen away from him on occasions, but of course he is also a race winner in F1 Sim Racing, which is a feat that no matter what happens today, he will still always have in his back pocket. And he'll be looking to build upon those race wins in this race potentially as well. But you've got to say, George, Unless anything drastically happens, it's looking like Nicolas Songo so far. Yeah, and this is the replay. This is the moment heading through Turn 1. So this is why Benham lost those places. And like I said, very late heading through towards Turn 1. Uh, I think the brakes just betraying him slightly under these wet conditions and leading to him dropping down the order. John Evans uh, then managing to pounce to move on up into that 16th place. So uh, unfortunately, uh, not an easy day at the office for Jake Benham, who's now got to try and recover. And it's less than easy, certainly under this wet weather, torrential rain here at Sandvoort. Nicholas Longe still sprinting clearer onwards and onwards now, currently 2.6 seconds and very nearly at 2.7 as well as Barry Broman could, still continues to try and defend the places further up. Alfie Butcher being forced to retain P3 in behind, but he's got to remain wary of Josh Edo and Thomas Ronha. But let's take a look at the restart, Hayden. Here we go. It was great formation between the two Ferrari drivers, Barry Broman just slotting in behind Nicholas Longe 
Tange. And I guess they had some sort of deal. Whoever leads into turn one, the other one will help them out with the strategy and let them run away with this. But let's watch on board now, this time with what looks like Jano Opnir. And this is his race start going into the first corner. Had the inside line, has a nice gap to sort of break into, but is, ha is held tight on the inside. There's a car on the outside, which is an Aston Martin. That's Fabrizio Donoso as we're getting another watch. And this time, this is from the point of view of Alfie Butcher heading down into the first corner. Tried to have a little look on Barry Bowman around the outside, but unfortunately, Barry just defended perfectly to hold that position. Yeah, Thomas Ronha now still closing up to Josh Edo. So Edo now in a bit of a predicament in his own right. You can just see there the kick F1 car plugged again right into the back of the Red Bull as it was not too long ago. Freddie Rasmussen, though, has come in to join the party. Remember, of course, he displaced Tom Manley uh, not too long ago as well. So the Red Bull team might yet get a chance to take down Thomas Ronha, drop him down to P6, and Red Bull can then work together to try and get past the likes of Alfie Butcher and Barry Bruman. But that's going to be very tough, considering that the Ferrari team are currently controlling the pace levels right now, as Jarno Otmir makes his way through the next right-hander. Of course, he'll then have one final corner to take at turn 14. Let's see if he can find the run here on Fabrizio Donoso Delgado. And I think he might, you know, he's going to try and go wheel to wheel. Switches back to the right-hand side as they head down in towards turn one. He's not going to make it, though. He's not going to go as late as, as Donoso did on the brakes. And the Chilean holding on with the Dutchman waiting in behind. Yeah, just put onto the uh, dirty side of the track and obviously the wetter side of the track as well. So you know what, they're not able to to get the performance out of the car at that stage. And it's just not worth the risk to stick your nose up the inside, especially if the track is going to be getting better later on. And he's going to be thinking as a lead Mercedes driver, that it's not only the two Ferraris that were close together in terms of track position. As we look on his screen, it does look like it's drying up out there. We're not quite yet set ready to go to dry tyres. But uh, yeah, he's going to be, as a lead Mercedes driver, going to be looking at how many positions he can pick up. Because look at Lucas Blakey and Danny Moreno. Only one car separating those two. Josh Hidu and Freddie Rasmussen, another two pairing, that they're going to have to try and figure out what they do when we get to the crossover phase. Yes, they can even go one lap later, but then you're just going to get swallowed up by the undercut. The one thing I would say, though, with the undercut is you're going to have to try and get the tyre temps up very, very quickly. Of course, there's no tyre blankets involved when you're having pit stops anymore, so those tyres will not be up to temperature as soon as they go onto the car. You're going to have to build that up, and going onto dry tyres in wet conditions could be something that can catch you out, but you will be on the right tyre at the right time, so it will still perform very well for yourself. But uh, Jano Watme, 12th place at the moment, still stuck behind Fabrizio Dino. So it's not Fassi uh, having not the strongest performance that we've seen from him so far, but I think we're going to see a lot of change later on in this race when it gets dry. Yeah, and I can tell you that the rain has actually stopped. The water that's actually been flicked up is the spray off the actual surface of the track. So Alfie Butcher needs to try and persevere now because this is where strategy comes under comes under the magnifying glass, given the fact that many of them would have opted to perhaps pit on certain laps. We could yet see a dramatic change in the winds here, though Longgate still very much in control up at the front. It's now become a three-second gap mm -hmm. as Barry Burrowman still continues to persevere in defending here against the rest of the field that are now queued up in behind him. Still no one content with making the move. We just saw Longgate curtailing in the distance in towards the chicane, coming through turn 11 and turn 12. Butcher still in hot pursuit further down. Freddie Rasmussen in all of this, trying to pursue after Thomas Ronha. Might be happy to wait in behind, wait until the pit stop phase to let everything unfold. Certainly so. Great strategy here from the Ferrari team. Three seconds between those two drivers trying to give themselves the best shot at a 1-2 in this wet-to-dry race. Jonah Martens and all Ron the Hart other in. guys. There we go. Thomas Ronhart makes the first pit stop and also coming into the pits, falling down the field. Danny Moreno and Ruben Pedreno as well. Two Spaniards into the box and going on to hard tyres is Thomas Ronhart and Danny Moreno. And I guess Pedreno will also be doing the same. So we've had our guinea pigs. They're going to be testing whether the hard tyres are the right ones to go on to, whether it is time for drives. And we're going to be seeing whether they can perform the undercut to maybe jump ahead of Barry Boromond in this race. Yeah, Ruben Pedreno actually uh, speeding in the pit lane five seconds second penalty was issued. Um, so there we have it. That's not going to help his race whatsoever. Alfie Butcher still, though, in hot pursuit of Barry Burman. Let's see how this is going to work out for Ron Ha. Obviously, the front uh, drivers at the highest end of the order are going to be looking to respond, potentially. Does Longay come in the pits? 
earlier than his teammate. Let's wait and see. Could it be the case that Ferrari can pull off the double stack? I think at this stage that might be a little tricky. They don't, they can't afford to lose any time during the pit stop phase, but certainly now, given the fact that many other cars have opted to box early at this point, well, you could consider it early. In many ways, it might be the right time as they now head through the final corners at turn 14 now, down the long straight. Longay still remains out. Barry sold the dummy to head into the pit lane, but Butcher comes in, so does Ido and Lucas Blakely. So both Ferrari staying out then, don't think that it's time for the dry tyres just yet. Patrick Sipos, a five second time penalty. Alpine loving the penalties today. Both of them getting a five second time penalty for speeding into the pit lane, which unfortunately the way that F1 sim racing goes, it's most likely that their race is done from there. But we'll see what they can do and where they can finish. And you just never know, especially in these wet to dry conditions. Into the box then, Alfie Butcher, Josh Edo, Lucas Blakely, Thomas Ronha, who obviously pitted one lap earlier. He is uh, currently side by side with uh, Fabrizio Donoso, who's on the intermediate tyres still. Patrick Sipos uh, into the box. Danny Moreno, of course, as well. And uh, Ruben Petreno. Ulas onto the Inters. So both of those guys opting to box to Inters rather than onto dry tyres. Whether that's a mistake from themselves from switching to the right tyre or whether that's something uh, strategy. But it looks like they've just made a mistake there by switching to the wrong tyres in the pit lane. And that's going to be very unfortunate for their race. Yeah, it's not ideal at all. There's Yulash Ozjodorim now, who has boxed onto those intermediate tyres. I tell you what, this is truly a bizarre situation. Some drivers opting for those inters, others opting for the hards, as we're now watching them make their way through towards turn 10, and very soon towards turn 11. We've got DRS enabled, so now, as far as race control are concerned, we are in dry conditions. Longe stays out, however. Into the pits comes Buraman on the attack. Yano Watmir and Ishmael Fassi running wheel to wheel, heading through turn one and heading up through the slalom. He's now going to hold position, Yano Watmir, in on-track third place. And now we've got Barry Burrowman switching on to the mediums. I tell you what, this is truly sensational. Yeah, those guys waiting two laps later than everybody else and thinking that the mediums now is the tyre to be on and the one that they can take till the end of the race. Where is Burrowman going to come out in comparison to Freddie Rasmussen? Looks like he's ahead of them. Side by side goes Fabrizio Donoso and Josh Edo. Obviously, Donoso on those intermediate tyres. He's going to be wounded in this race. He's trying to hold it around the outside and he does. He stays ahead of Josh Edo in this race. But Barry Burrowman and the leader out of the drivers who have switched on to the dry tyres. So working perfectly, it'd be interesting to see where Nicholas Longay comes out. You'd assume he would stay in the lead of this race with that three second gap that Boromund helped him, helped him to have. Yeah, absolutely right indeed. Still Longe yet to pit, as is Yoni Tormle, Jana Watmir as well. Surely they've got to come in on this lap as we've got some more wheel-to-wheel -wheel action heading through towards turn 10. Round the outside, we've got the Alpha Tauri. Look at this, three wide, down the other. DRS straight, rear wings are open to no so manly, who's now trying to hold on here. Figure out this, it's absolutely madness heading through the chicane now as Butcher holds on to eighth, Donoso down in ninth, Manly in tenth, and into the pits. Lo and behold, Fassi, Otmir, Tormela, and Longe. Yeah, it was a mistake from Fabrizio Tenoso. They think that it's still good for intermediate tyres. So they're staying out on Inters. And Nicholas Longay also going to Inters, but did not look happy about it. So he doesn't think that it's going to be time for Inters. Of course, they might work well at the moment, but it is going dry. It is certainly drying up. So they're going to work for maybe a couple of laps. But in a couple of laps' time, we're going to be onto the dry. So Fabrizio Tenoso obviously making them work. He's coming back through the field. Nicholas Longay still in the lead of this race, but have Ferrari have uh, thrown it all away. But one thing they could possibly do is get Barry Boromund once again to hold up the pack. There's a lot of corners around this Zandvoort circuit. Very difficult to overtake around here. He could hold everybody up as much as possible to give Nicholas Longay the best chance. But it's such a long pit stop around here. It's going to be difficult. They're going to have to. Surely there has to be a swap. Uh, I heard Longay in behind. He was certainly not happy about the situation. Tormela and Thomas Ronha also now running wheel to wheel on the outside of turn 10. A bizarre race here at this Dutch Grand Prix circuit of Zandvoort. Ronha and Tormela continuing to duel, heading in towards turn 11 through the chicane, now go, rumbling over the curves, does Thomas Ronha, a committed move, around the outside of the Alpha Tauri, becoming late to the inside heading through towards turn 13 and 14, he'll now make his way onwards and upwards in the top 10 places and he's in with a chance for points 
Jake Benham into the box then, switches over to the medium tyres, which means Nicholas Longay regains the lead of this Zandvoort Grand Prix. He's still in front. Barry Broman, though, the gap 4.4 seconds, waiting to see whether he's going to pull the strategic masterclass in this race to still try and help the Ferrari team secure a 1-2. But, uh, yeah, Nicholas Longay, he did select the dry tyres, but the game gave him the inters. So he's not going to be happy about that one, and I'm sure that will be looked into later on. But Freddie Rasmussen on the attack of Barry Broman as he's trying to hold up these drivers that gap is gaining it's now five seconds it was about 4.5 at the start of this lap so he has to play this strategically he needs to hold him up in the right places and make sure that freddie rasmussen doesn't stick one up the inside and get past him freddie rasmussen the 2020 race winner here at the dutch grand prix he's gonna have his chance and he's got to commit here at 10 10 they make contact as they head down this long straight now rasmussen's got his nose in front the car is in front and enter alfie butcher who's also looking to take advantage barry burman committed to the inside through turn 11, Burrowman defiant in the face of danger against Butcher, but Rasmussen still laying claim to that P2. Rasmussen certainly going to be in trouble for that one, stuck it up the inside, made contact with Barry Burrowman, and I'm sure that's going to be discussed in the stewards room later. He's trying to break away, but Barry Burrowman needs to reel him back in. He needs to, you know, borrow Nicholas Longay's Woody. Let's sue Freddie Rasmussen to get back into the lead of this race and get back on the plan. The gap is 5.6 seconds. It has extended, but he needs to get back in front, re-overtake him, and try and hold up for Nicholas Longe. The gap is coming down, though, now that Freddie Rasmussen is the net leader. It's 5.2 uh, seconds is the gap between those guys. We're watching Yoni Tomla. A, a great drive from Yoni Tomla inside the points at the moment, you've got to say. Fantastic for them. Yeah, it truly is. And uh, Yoni Tomla now curtailing through this next downwards in swinger all the cars still very much uh, in tune with one another lucas blakely also all over the rear of josh edo and that red bull i think is going to come under attack but uh, in a opposite sense of the word freddie rasmussen now within a chance of closing up to longay I, I am curious as to seeing how much this gap's going to come down by because remember rasmussen on those hard tires that he can obviously attempt to get to the end Longay, however, on intermediate tyres that are surely not going to work under a dry track. Yeah, and he's extending that gap over Barry Broman. Barry is not close right now to try and go on the attack of Freddie Rasmussen. He's actually more focused on Alfie Butcher behind. There's only four tenths between those guys, and it's seven tenths to Freddie Rasmussen. Freddie, though, could be burning the battery trying to close up that gap as quickly as possible to get past him, and he certainly is. Fastest lap so far for Freddie Rasmussen. Jake Benham, though, on the mediums, also flying. Jano Watmir with some good strategy up in speed 10, now fighting with Johnny Tomala. Yeah, coming out of turn one now, Jano Watmir looking to commit to the inside, but can't quite lay down the hammer as he still remains in 10th place. Still has points to Zotmir. There's now the flying Dutchman at his own home Grand Prix circuit, as well as Ronars makes his way over the crest and now through this sequence of subtle curves before heading downhill and very shortly they'll head into sector two now as they now hurtle through this next right once again the right, Fienza team that are currently occupying in ninth Johnny Tormler having a great race right now of course on those hard tyres that will take him to the end he's got three lap pressure tyres than those ahead of him Thomas Ronhar on six laps as now Fasti looks for his favourite switchback as he looks to try and challenge Brendan Lee he's got the arrow he's got the slip he's got the DRS but very nearly pushed onto the grass Fasti as well Brendan moving as well ahead of him trying to defend the place against Fasti Fasti undaunted is going to continue to persevere in behind the kick F1 car Brendan Lee moving all over the place to make sure he does not lose that position to the Williams driver Nicholas Longo that gap now coming down oh. 1.8 seconds he's like a sitting duck in this race with Freddie Rasmussen hunting him down. Fassi though does overtake Brendan Lee down in towards the start finish straight into turn one. Fassi on the inside, Lee on the outside. Can he hold it though? Fassi's going to go wheel to wheel with them as they go into the next section of corners, but Fassi on the inside. Brendan Lee though will get the inside into the sweeping uh, curve uh, bank corner and then he has to concede position there. He has to take Fassi. He has to stay composed here, Hayden. He has to stay composed. And I tell you this, Brendan Lee is not done yet. He's still on hard tyres. He's on the dry compounded tyres, the favourable tyres. But what doesn't help is that Jake Benham on faster, medium tyres and has already shown that he's capable of fighting. He's battled with many a car behind him. And he's gone for a late lunch around the outside, heading out of turn nine. Turn 10 might offer something down the inside and he will send it. Does young Jake Benham, the all-star, looking to try and break down the two-time world champion? DRS now open for the pair of them now as they look to make their way down towards turn 11. Brendan Lee trying to cover him off like he did with Fasti earlier. Great move from Jake Benham, making his way out of turn 12. That's what he needed, just breaking ahead of Brendan Lee. He's on the faster tyres than Lee and he could pursue after Ismail Fasti. 
Meanwhile, the, the race leader, Nicholas Longe, getting swallowed up by everybody right now. He's falling down the field, ninth, tenth, and now he's peeling into the pit lane. He has to. He has to bail off those intermediate tyres and stick on a brand new set, unfortunately, there. Unless anything massive happens in this race, Nicholas Longe, the pole sitter, is just falling away from him with that mistake going onto the intermediate tyres there. Really unfortunate for Nicholas Longe, and I'm sure Ferrari will be massively, massively annoyed with that. Yeah, I'm sure they will. Barry Burraman now, it's kind of changed now, hasn't it? Whereas Barry was trying mm. to protect Longe's lead, Barry's now the man they need to try and take race victory here, Ferrari. And uh, obviously that would make him a two-time race winner after taking victory at Spa last time. Jake Benham uh, currently holding on to 10th, but Ishmael Fasti looking to try and take it back. Benham managing to get the move done on the outside of Turn 9, heading through Turn 10. He is a man on a mission. Benham's had his challenges. He had technical issues before, has since now managed to rise to the occasion and take 10th place away. His teammate Jana Watmier ahead of him, and he's pursuing Yoni Tormala. Jay Benham absolutely flying in this race, which poses the question, will there be team orders at the Mercedes team to try and let Benham through and go on the attack of Yoni Tormela? Jano Watmir has had his fair opportunity to try and overtake the Alpha Tauri driver, but has not been able to do it so far. So unless Jano Watmir starts to make some move, then Jake Benham's going to have to maybe have a go at that one instead. Uh, Nicholas Longe now down in 19th position. Also looks like he's sped into the pit lane too, just adding to the sorrows for the Ferrari team. It looks so good at the start of the race. They were smashing the strategy. Barry Borman holding everybody up, helping his teammate. And in doing so now, it just kind of looks like they've thrown this race win away to Freddy Rasmussen. Well, even in the more metaphorical sense, Hayden, when it rains, it pours, as they say. Uh, of course, we witnessed lots of that at the very start. Freddy Rasmussen still at the head of the order. Barry Borman trying to stay within tow. He does have the medium tyres. The question is, though, can he take them all the way? Will they still be uh, good enough to hang on towards the end of the race because he's got to consider Tom Manley in behind and we know how fast uh, Manley really is as we now take a look at Nicholas Longe's POV. He's got a lot of work to do here. 3.1 seconds behind Fabrizio De Nosto. Never say never, but I would say at this situation, certainly given the number of cars that are ahead of him, this is really a struggle for Longe. Yeah, 15 laps to try and catch up what is uh, 15 seconds of lap time. So needs well over a second a lap and also make a couple of positions and overtakes in those laps as well. So Nicholas Longe has got a really difficult situation to get anywhere near a point in this race, especially now with that penalty that he's carrying as well. Will to will though, it's Giannis, Giannis Otmir and Thomas Ronha, Ronha on the inside, but Otmir goes right around the outside of the kick driver, moves himself up in P7. It's mediums versus hard, it's old versus new tyres, and here comes Jake Benham trying to pounce on the kick driver as well. Mercedes trying to overtake the field right now. Benham though stuck behind Thomas Ronha. Otmir opened the door, Benham tried to fill it, and unfortunately he still has to stay behind. He certainly does. It was Dutchman versus Dutchman through the first sector. Here at the Dutch Grand Prix circuit of Zanvoort, Jana Watmir prevailing against Thomas Ronha in this instance. Benham going down the inside at turn nine as well. That's a blistering move. This aggressive nature from young Jake Benham is truly a pleasure to watch as he now looks to try and take the outside line, inviting as well Yoni Tormler into the mix as they go three wide, heading down through towards turn 11 this time. Who's going to be last on the brakes? Here we see Benham holding on. Still on the inside, Thomas Ronha. Here comes Manley, as they now look to go wheel-to-wheel, Tormala, -to -wheel, I should say, as they run wheel-to-wheel -wheel through the final two corners. Benham in eighth, Ronha in ninth, Yoni Tormala remaining in tenth. Thomas Ronha just about able to edge Yoni Tormala in that corner there, and there is Ishmael Fassi, though, with a great run out of the final corner. It's going to take two for one, moves up into ninth position, and for Thomas Ronha, once again, just like we saw last night, it's just all falling away from him in this race. Maybe a little bit of a disaster on the strategy going on to those hard tyres compared to the other drivers on the mediums, but will the tyres come back to him later on in this race? Will, once those medium tyres get past the 25% point, the hards could be the tyre to be on, and Thomas Ronha might be able to make a few overtakes. Yeah, Ronha now has got a little bit of a mission on his hands. He's got a driver behind, has got three lap pressure hard tyres on the car. Yoni Tormler still persevering here and has a great chance to land his own point for Alpha Tari this time around. Here we ride on board with certainly someone who has been part of this championship now since its very beginning, Tormala, who was, uh, has been part of the Red Bull franchise now in, his entire, in the entirety of his history in Formula One sim racing, and now makes his way through the final two corners here on lap 23 of 36. He should get a nice run heading down through towards turn one. The question is, will it be enough to get past Thomas Ronha's kick F1 car. As we can now see the rear light flashing on Thomas Ronha. 
many drivers opting to, to save ERS. We just caught the ERS line on Tormala's car. He's only got 11% of energy in that car right now, so he won't be able to use it to challenge Ronha for that P10. Also out of energy is Thomas Ronha. His light was flashing down the start finish straight. I think a lot of drivers are struggling with the ERS. There's not a lot to uh, try to build up that battery around a circuit like Zambor. So, um, yeah, they're struggling with the battery deployment at the moment in this race. Barry Borman, though, probably not struggling with it because he's sitting nicely and tidily behind Freddie Rasmussen at the moment. We saw yesterday him fighting with Lucas Blakely, waited till the last moment, but it was the opposite way around. Lucas Blakely had the softer compound of tyres that kind of dropped off at the last lap. This time around, Barry has the softer compound of tyres compared to Freddie Rasmussen. Both of them have won a race in this season so far. Someone who hasn't, who's up in the top three, Tom Manley. Could he be our sixth race winner? Also from our sixth different race team. Could be, as we now watch Manley head round the final quarter. Currently sat third place and chasing after Barry Burrow, and as this continues, the better it will turn out for Manley, who can then look to attack Barry Burrow, man, for that P2 spot as they now heading towards turn one. Ishmael Fassi leaving it very late on the brakes as well as he looks to challenge young Jake Benham, sat behind his teammates as well, and Fassi just with a little, with a few words to himself, we know how passionate he is. We know how much he loves to switch back as well as he tries to get a little bit of leverage going over the crest, out of the bank corners, coming out of the first sector, heading in towards sector two. A little brush of the eyebrows as he now dives down through this right hand and now a very attractive segment of circuit, but very treacherous at the same time with the curbing on the left hand side, which can very easily upset the balance of your car. Fasty now wasn't able to pull off any sort of an overtake. Benham preempting anything by sending it very shallow down the inside at turn nine. As we now see as well, Jan Watbier persevering after Lucas Blakely, the two champions colliding. As we now see them come down through towards turn 11, Fassi once again squirming all over the back of Benham. Benham frustrating him here. Yeah, these two need to stop fighting so hard because they're all on the medium tyres. You've got Otme, you've got Benham, you've got Fassi, who need to start to make a few inroads on the likes of Lucas Blakely and Josh Edu, who are on the hards, before, of course, those hard tyres start becoming better than the mediums. But Fassi not giving up just yet, pulling away from the slipstream to make sure they can cool down their engine down the start finish straight, looking behind him to make sure that Thomas Ronhart doesn't go for any sort of dive and make sure where, and see where Thomas Ronhart's car is uh, in, in, in comparison to where his car is down the start finish straight. But uh, Fassi holding on to P9. Tom is still in the points and he's going to have Brendan Lee to back him up at the moment. But Brendan Lee is on two lap younger tyres. So will he be asking the team at kick, hey, let's switch this around. I've got better tyres. Yeah, you do have to wonder as they head through the Schleviak corner now on lap 26 of 36. We've got 10 laps still to go. And Ishmael Fassi still persevering against Benham in behind Ron Hart and Lee. They're both together as well. Further up the order, still the gap the same between Burrowman and Rasmussen. We've got Manley down in third place, now getting closer. He's within three tenths of a second, though he's unable to find the answers against the Ferrari in front of him just yet. You get the feeling that it's all going to come down to the final dying moments of this race. You can cut it with a knife. Tension, I mean, as they head through the final couple of corners. There's Fassi on the tail of young Jake Benham in behind Ronha and Brendan Lee. When will frustration start to show? You can imagine there's a few of them out there. A lot of them gaining some reasonable slip and at the same time with DRS, they can plummet their way down towards turn one. Pedrenu and Shipos are now swapping and you can see now wheel to wheel. John Evans is on the rise and brushes past Yoni Tormala and he's on the medium tyres. He's making them work for him and now he's going to try and tackle Brendan Lee as Alvaro Caraton also tries to enter the top 10 equation. Yeah, Alvaro Caraton has a great opportunity here. Look at the battery, 72%. I know how he has it uh, dimmed down on... Uh, on his dash at the moment, but you can just about see that there's 70% for him, and you can see Yoni Tomala's rear light flashing. So that means that he's got less than 10% deployment in his car. John Evans as well. So Alvaro Caraton will be looking to try and get past both those drivers, but needs to time it perfectly because he doesn't want to waste his battery getting past those guys. And then they're all on the equal performance, and he's only made up a couple of positions. He needs to time it well to try and move further up through the field. Freddie Rasmussen still holding the front at the moment with Barry Boromond in second place. Tom Manley, this is a driver that we'd be, you know, if we see him win the race, we have six different race winners. We make this, in, this championship very interesting indeed. He has battery, he's deploying it at the moment just a little bit out of the corner just to make sure that Alfie Butcher doesn't have a look into it towards turn one. But holding it for the time being, Barry though, right up behind Freddie Rasmussen there. Yeah, here comes Alvaro Caraton down the inside. He's going to go for a double overtake, I think. He's going to try and tackle John Evans coming out of turn one. 
Carrots on, remember, with that energy under his belt. He's managed to displace Johnny Tormala. Did fancy a go at John Evans, whose rear light is also flashing. And with him depleting his energy, with Carrotton holding so much, that places the Aston Martin in a disadvantage. Certainly so. Alvaro Carrotton trying to cut his way through the field at the moment. John Evans still ahead. His rear light is flashing. And Alvaro Carrotton is going to be looking to pounce as soon as he possibly can. He needs to make sure he does it cleanly and needs to make sure he doesn't lose time to the cars ahead because he doesn't want to drop out the DRS zone and uh, lose that train. We're watching now Tom Manley right behind Barry. Barry had an attack at uh, Freddie Rasmussen. Got very close running down into the first corner, but now dropped off just a little bit. Six tenths of a second between those two. He's still within that DRS marker. Does want to close up that gap just to make sure it does not slip out of one second. Look at the back of the train now. Danny Moreno. Not been the most impressive day there for Danny Moreno. He started uh, his life, you know, up into that top 10 and was looking like he could potentially score some points on his uh, return to F1 Sim Racing. But somehow, you know, he's found himself in P P P14 at the moment as he goes for the overtake on Yoni, uh, Yoni Tomala, who has not got that uh, deployment. But of course, he has got older uh, tyres. Look at that, 17 laps compared to most of the field who are on about 15, 14 right now. This is Alfie Butcher up at the front trying to hunt down Tom Manley but also trying to defend from Josh Edu in this race he started third for the Zandvoort Grand Prix and he's currently lost one position in this race but Barry Borman on those medium tyres and you've got to think at some point they're going to start to drop off and he's not going to have that performance for him no not at all Butcher now in fourth and uh, still trying to close on Manley. Manley getting very close to the back of Burman, but you can see the gaps. He, until he goes to the move, he won't be able to benefit from it, but he's going to try now anyway, because now the team from Faenza battle against Marinello again. This time at Zanvort, a switch back from Manley. Is he going to leave it late into turn 11? Thought about it, but the very fact he went wheel to wheel heading through turn 10 could be an indicator that Barry Burman's tyres might be un upsetting his race here at this point. We are on lap 29 and 36, a long way to go still in the context of all this, and a great chance for Manley to pounce here on Barry, and this will be music to Freddie Rasmussen's ears because it means he can just persevere onwards. Ferrari, have they made the wrong strategical choice? They are slowly falling through the field, under attack now from Tom Manley. Tom Manley could do a solid for the Red Bull family here and maybe try to stake his claim for a potential Red Bull seat in the future. If he fights in battles with Barry Borman, that's going to allow Freddie Rasmussen to run away. Very similar to what we saw at the start of the event in Jeddah, where the guys were fighting too much for second place. It allowed Freddie to run away in that race, and of course, came home with the race win. But uh, Tom Manley now battling with Barry Borman right up behind him. Look, it's one tenth of a second between those guys. But Barry, you know, importantly, is within that one second gap of Frederick Rasmussen. So he can hold on to the DRS and can help him down the uh, this straight here and also down the start finish straight. The 16 lap old tires, they are slowly going to start to die off at some point. But the hards working well at the moment, but not enough to really pounce on those medium runners. Also on the mediums, you've got Jano Otmir, Jake Benham and Fassi. Now they were really climbing through the field earlier on. That seems to have come to a halt behind the reigning champion, Lucas Blakely. Maybe just the experience of Lucas Blakely able to hold them behind for the time being. Tom Manley pulling out of the slipstream there of Barry Borman just to cool the engine as Alfie Butcher was also doing the same, moving to the left getting away from Tom and Manley. Further down the field, penalties, of course, for Ruben, Pedrino, Patrick Siepels. We've got a battle here. John Evans going wheel to wheel with Alvaro Caraton. Caraton's been trying to get past him for a while, and he finally does it and moves himself up in a P12. Yeah, I've been impressed with Caraton. Obviously, coming back from illness uh, today, uh, did not feature because Will Lewis uh, came in as his substitute. Here comes Danny Moreno, who's now also looking to try and brush past John Evans. They make contact heading through the Slaviak corner. Moreno committing to the outside, and the Papaya McLaren sends it up the outside side oh my goodness me very nearly lost the car altogether just managing to catch it superior driving skills we know he loves to race on the edge and he's done it again p13 for danny moreno no inch given between those two drivers and john evans in the end just making slight contact with danny moreno on the outside of that corner but moreno was able to edge him out of the track and uh, get that position and move himself up into p13 alvaro caraton fantastic maneuver there to get to p12 none of them though losing the drs from the drivers, which is obviously the important thing. You want to make these overtakes, of course. You want to move yourself up the field. But if you're going to do it, and you're going to lose uh, DRS to the cars ahead, and you've got no ERS deployment left, then you might as well just stay in position because you're not going to have that chance to climb even further up the field and move yourself into the points. Because, of course, from Brendan Lee down, there are no points awarded for where you finish in this race. Yeah, Danny Moreno now settling in 13th place. 20 laps uh, of hard, uh, or 20 lap old hard 
uh, under his car right now, still trying to close up to fellow Spaniard Alvaro Caraton. As they now hurtle over the crest down through Slaviak corner once again. In sector two, they'll then hurtle through towards sector three. There's Ruben Pedreño for the Alpine team as they look to try and close up to John Evans. Unfortunately, Evans' energy, I think, is betraying him again here this time. Pedreño with a chance here on hard tyres. Evans' tyres also must be failing here at this point because he's being picked off by the likes of Caraton and Moreno and a few other cars that have also had a go at him heading through towards the final portions of this race. Still Rasmussen out in front. Barry Burman not out of the equation here, though. Still remains six tenths away and has every chance, but he's going to need that DRS, I think, later on in this race. Timing has never been more important, very much like he timed his move at Spa on Lucas Blakely to take race victory. He needs to do the same again this time. These are, this is a battle between two race winners this season looking to take their second. Yeah, don't count out Barry Bromham because we saw him do it exactly that yesterday, of course. So uh, we might be able to do the exact same strategy where he just sits and waits patiently. And then the best real time to, to pounce for that overtake would be going into the last lap on the start finish straight. You don't want to do it later on when you have that second DRS zone because by that point, you know, Freddie Rasmussen could just wait and um, build up his battery for them. Tom Manny, though, still all over the back of Barry Burman at this stage of the race and he'll be looking for that opportunity further down the field. I think those drivers are just struggling with their ERS management because if you look up at the front, Tom Manley, he's very, very comfortable in this race. 62% battery for him so far. I'm sure Barry has something very similar, as does Freddie Rasmussen, as do those drivers at the front. But the reason they're falling through the field, Yoni Tormala, John Evans, Ruben Pedrano, they all just don't have any battery left in their car. So when they want to defend, they've got nothing to defend with. No, not at all. We're taking a look at the rear wing on Barry Bruman's car. He looks to try and persevere and build that gap between he and Tom Manley. Trying to use the RS to close the gaps as they look to perhaps maneuver away through the corners here at Zandvoort. The elevation also being tricky for many of the drivers to contest with. Further back, Sheepos and Pedreño now swapping places as Sheepos now moves up to 16th place. As we now see Manley getting very close again to the back of the Scuderia Ferrari. Remember, of course, Manley have alluded to him being an F1 Esports Challenges champion on Xbox in the past. Uh, certainly no surprise to see him at the highest level. He's got the fellow F1 Esports Challenges champion, Alfie Butcher, in behind. Only his was won on the PC platform. Of course, the platform that we do have uh, with this F1 Esports uh, or this F1 Sim Racing World Championship on. As they now make their way through on lap 34 of 36. Two laps of magic await them this time. Freddie Rasmussen bidding to become a two-time race winner this season and also a two-time race winner here at the Dutch Grand Prix circuit of Zandvoort. They'll be very comfortable in the Red Bull family knowing you've got two very strong drivers in Freddie Rasmussen and Josh Edo currently in the top five at the moment. But of course, the young talent coming through the ranks. Tom Manny, we've seen Jed Norgrove with some fantastic performances. And of course, Johnny Tomler, you know, he had a good performance in qualifying, currently P14 at the moment. But you kind of need that experienced head to kind of nurture this young, talent, especially in a LAN event. Yoni Tomlin has been here before. He can help those guys and really get the best out of them as the two kit cars decide to swap positions. Or do they? They weren't really giving up too easily, but Brendan Lee ahead of his teammate Thomas Ronha. He does have the better tyres, 21 laps compared to 23, and I think that was probably uh, rehearsed between those two guys. But yeah, Red Bull family sitting very comfortable at the moment that they've got talent for years to come. Yeah, and while Ronha forfeits that place, it does mean that he could yet forfeit the lead of the championship because if Freddie Rasmussen does continue, he should mathematically take the championship lead at this point. With Barry Brumand in behind in second place, we're on the penultimate lap of the race this time as they make their way through the middle sector through towards turn 10. Manley further up, still four tenths behind Brumand, and Brumand losing time on Rasmussen further up, who seems to be now applying the pressure, turning the screw, using that ERS to try and build that gap. But uh, of course, with Brumand having DRS, he's able to retain at least some of the delta, but it slips away as he makes his way through some of the apexes of the corners. Rasmussen looking like he's on the better tyres right now, and not only that, holds enough of a comfortable gap in order to retain this P1, and he'll need it as they now begin the final lap of the race. Here on lap 36, Freddie Rasmussen still leads, Barry Burman getting closer, but not close enough to make a move at all. 
The chat going crazy, awaiting for a last lap battle. Barry Berman four temps behind, but you've got to watch this man, Tom Manley. He's most likely to make an overtake on this final lap, right behind Barry Berman as they're fighting for that second place in this race. Both on the podium, a fantastic performance from Manley, but also watch out for Alfie Butcher behind. Freddie's been flashing. a strong performance, and Freddie is flashing. That is interesting to see because Barry Berman can now go on the attack into this second DRS zone. He certainly can, coming through now into, well, out of the Slovak corner through turn nine and through towards turn 10 with Freddy's rear light flashing suggests that the ERS has finally been depleted but enough of a gap surely has been built heading down towards turn 11 at the chicane there you see Barry Brumman in behind I think more concerned about Manley in third place but Freddy Rasmussen getting the jettison out of these final corners now he's going to look to round turn 13 very soon to be turn 14 alike the Red Bull giving him wings once again and it's double Dutch Grand Prix delight for Freddy Rasmussen the Great Dane scores a second victory of the season here in the Formula 1 sim racing Dutch Grand Prix he left it close though. Barry Borman, one tenth behind, trying to fight back on the right to the death, right to the line there. And unfortunately, just missed out on those medium tyres, utilizing all of that ERS right to the end. Tom Manley, what a performance from the Alpha Tauri driver to finish on the podium in today's race. But there's going to be a lot of frustrations down at Ferrari. One, two in those wet conditions. But over at the crossover phase, it all just fell away from them. Nicholas Longay. Whether it was a mistake from himself, a mistake from the game, we'll have to wait and see. But he brought put onto intermediate tyres when he wanted the drives and everybody else was on the drives. Unfortunately, had to finish way down the field in P19. Barry Berman as well, trying to play the team game. And unfortunately, it all fell away from him as well and finished in P2, George. But there we go. Look at him. Tom Manley, what a performance from him and definitely a star of the future. Yeah, Tom Manley with a stellar performance once again. Uh, a podium uh, going to himself too. I mean, credit to him. Uh, inconsolable, uh, Nicholas Longay, uh, without any shadow of a doubt, getting consoled by his fellow team members, including Barry Bruman. It was such a devastating moment. He wasn't the only one to do it. We saw intermediates returning out onto the track for a couple of cars uh, as the rain came to a close. Uh, many of them then adopting the, uh, the slick tyres where we saw the hards come out, as did the mediums. But Longe knew, given the position that they were in, he had a few seconds of advantage coming into the pits. It all seeped away as soon as the Inters became the non-optimal tyre and the track started to dry up. Yeah, I don't think anyone can help but sympathise there with Nicholas Longe because he was having such a strong race. He had such a gap there in that position and it all just sadly fell away from him. Great team that were there in Ferrari, of course, all around uh, Nicholas Longe in this uh, Devastating moment for him. Alfie Butcher, though, strong performance. We talked a little bit about the, the inconsistencies for him, despite having such strong pace. And there's his dad from Alfie Butcher. Congratulate him on such a strong performance to finish in P4. He will be slightly disappointed because he did start in P3, but I think he can be happy with that, that it, this is the important thing for Alfie Butcher. It's not necessarily about fighting for the championship in your rookie season. It's just putting in those performances learning from this experience and trying to become a better driver for the future. Yeah, and what about his uh, future prospects as well, Hayden? Because, you know, when drivers do well, that's when other teams come sniffing around. And obviously Alfie Butcher, yeah, yeah. you can imagine, is at the top of anyone's shopping list right now. Truly a stellar debut season on his part. And since arriving at Haas, has been the sole provider of points pretty much for his team. I mean, that's, you can't get much of a better advert than that. Certainly has, and there is a lot of young talent throughout the field. Obviously, Tom Manley, he's within the Red Bull family, but maybe someone will want to pinch him and drive for one of their top teams as well. Ishmael Fassi has been putting in some stellar, stellar performances at Williams. Maybe someone further up the grid will be looking at him as well. But uh, yeah, Nicholas Longe, really not happy, and everybody's just discussing what has gone on with this race at the moment. Uh, Alfie Butcher in the background there. And there's Brendan Lee, both uh, the kick drivers. Not a strong performance from them either. Of course, they were fighting for the championship the Constructors' Championship early on. Obviously, Thomas Ronhard was leading the championship. He definitely won't be leading the Drivers' Championship anymore, finishing outside the points. Do you think that was wise from kick to switch them around? Even though it would have been one point for Thomas Ronhard, it still would have been a point. Well, he's, he's been the driver that has spearheaded their team, and you, you've got to wonder, you know, who made that call? I mean, Longay. I mean, just look at that. It, it almost breaks your heart to see it, really. But, um, of course, the Frenchman who was been on the scene in F1 Esports and F1 Sim Racing as a whole, um, has really given his all. I mean, historically, he too, part of the Red Bull family uh, long ago when he was drafted uh, to the championship and then eventually finding himself at Renault 
as well, and well which would soon become Alpine, and then later uh, to Alfa Romeo before coming to Ferrari. And uh, someone who you'd definitely envision to be a, one of the favourites to win a title at some point, just by his sheer pace and his sheer pedigree out on track. He is just a truly phenomenal driver. But it has to be said, um, truly dramatic scenes in the paddock. A very obscure race, Ariana. The highs and lows of our sport, <laughs> absolutely heartbreaking for Nicholas Longet. I mean, I can't, I can't stop glancing back at him because it's so, so sad to see. But victory for mm -hmm. Freddie Rasmussen. But what did you make of that contact? Yeah, I think there could be something to look into. I think Barry Broman could have the race win given to him because Freddie Rasmussen on the inside had a little look and he just kind of understood slightly into Broman's path. They came together and that was ultimately what allowed Freddie Rasmussen to get the overtake because it unsettled Broman's car. He lost time and that allowed Freddie Rasmussen to overtake him. So Freddie Rasmussen takes the race win but could have a penalty coming his name, which you'd never want in F1 sim racing, of just because the not. field is so close together that it's not like, you know, real life Formula One where you get a five place grid penalty or five second penalty and you're going to lose maybe one position. This one, you could drop fully out of the points. Yeah, really, really tough. I've just seen that Nicholas Longe is now out of his rig. He seems to be cheering up a little bit. Of course, we spoke to the Ferrari uh, team just before the race. They were saying how important they are as a team and they're all looking out for one another. And that's going to be crucial right now, isn't it? To get them back in their right headspace for the next race. Uh, and yeah, uh, around a track like Kota, which is just as volatile. Uh, I mean, we, like we spoke about, some of the, the biggest corners you see him walking off there, obviously bit, uh, absolutely inconsolable. Uh, I did just catch Jonah Martins walking by and he looked at me and shook his head, um, obviously not happy. Um, with what's occurred. Uh, I think on many levels, Ferrari, I think are going to be a little disappointed because not only did the strategy fall apart, but then, like you said, with Rasmussen cutting in so deep, heading through towards turn 10. I mean, yeah, there's definite grounds here for steward intervention. Uh, I mean, we'll have to wait and see. I, they could be very busy going into the night here. Uh, but yeah, moving across to Texas, different track, but at the same time, this is where Ferrari need to strike. Uh, I mean, they're going to be feeling rotten after bottling a front row lockout. Absolutely. Right, let's have a little look at the race results, shall we? Take us through it. Here we go then. Race win for now. Provisionally goes to Freddie Rasmussen. A good drive from him, but that contact will be looked at, certainly by the stewards. Barry Bromond on the podium. Second place is exactly where he started in this race, but he will be wanting more. Tom Manley, fantastic performance there from the Alpha Tari driver, P3. And Alfie Butcher, that consistency is starting to build up. P4, fantastic for him. Josh Edo in the Red Bull, also P5. Lucas Blakely in sixth. With Jana Watmir and Jake Benham, the Mercedes, in seventh and eighth. Ishmael Fassi, ninth position in that race and Brendan Lee getting the final point in 10th place. Outside the points, our championship leader going into this race, Thomas Ronha, P11. He'll be looking to bounce back over the rest of the season. Alvaro Caraton stepping in from his illness, could only manage P12 with Danny Moreno back in F1 Sim Racing, finishing in P13. Unfortunately, our pole position driver disappointed and very upset with finishing in P20 understandably so now we can also look at who managed to grab the dhl fastest lap point and it was ishmael farsi with the fastest lap there on lap 36 i believe it was yep very well done to him that's an extra point in the bag and now i think it's time to talk to some of the other drivers who grabbed a reasonable number of points today our podium sitters are with claire yeah, alongside me, Tom Manley. Now, Tom, congratulations. In your fourth race, you're on the podium. Yeah, um, very stressful race. I mean, I could have maybe been a bit more aggressive and fought for the win, but I thought, you know, fourth race, I'll just take this P3. And Barry on the mediums, it was, you know, I was giving my all, but couldn't unfortunately get it. You were close, getting closer and closer and closer. I know you couldn't quite get it at the end, but you must be so pleased with your first podium. Yeah, I mean, with the transition, like mid-race, it was quite stressful. It was quite a long one, so some people pit too early. I think we nailed the box lap, so gained a few places there and just saw the race out from there. Uh, for yourself, how are you feeling about your next race? Obviously, we're going to Kota. Yeah, starting 12th, I think, so it will be tricky. We're going to have to gain places again, but I think, yeah, can maybe fight for points, but I think a podium is a bit out of reach there. Well, congratulations. Go and celebrate with your team. We're going to bring in uh, the second place driver. And I appreciate there's a lot of emotions going on at the moment, Barry. Um, your teammate first, how's he feeling? Is he all right? Yeah, well, um, I don't know what to say, to be honest, because um, 
It was actually so weird. Uh, we did uh, such a good teamwork on purpose. I slowed down the train, so he was leading by four seconds, and it was kind of easy win for him. And he even put the right tires, but the game, uh, I don't know, for some reason, decided to put him on um, intermediate again. Of course, uh, from easy win, his race completely got finished. And uh, yeah, emotionally, I, I can completely feel how, how he feels. It's, it's really bad and uh, to be honest I'm you know P2 is still good and but I'm still I'm still really gutted for him you know um, he was really fast we made a really good teamwork I made four second gap for him and even if you can see the stream when he pitted he was still ahead of everyone but yeah it is what it is I don't know I don't know what can, what what would happen but yeah we are really gutted. Let's talk about your race, though. I, I appreciate you've got your, your feelings for your teammate who was visibly upset at the end of that race. But for you, you did hold off Tom Manley for a long time on tyres that I could kind of hear you weren't very happy with to start with. Uh, yeah, I mean, the tyres, the we put the mediums, I think maybe we did a mistake, maybe we not, I don't know. But uh, I just tried to save the tyres as much as I can. And the last few laps, I had zero tyres. I made time, uh, Tom behind me. It was really tough. But I mean, still, I would take uh, P2 uh, because I think the strategy wasn't really perfect with the mediums. But I mean, still P2, not bad. Been a bit of a roller coaster for Ferrari this week, hasn't it? Yeah, like always, um, always some um, something not going right. Like always, um, always like some something not going right. It's it's really painful because we as a team put so many effort behind the scenes. And as you can see, we are really quick in raw speed, raw, raw speed and everything, and it's just not going well. Always for one of us, it's actually pain. These points, though, incredibly important for the championship for you. Yeah, it is. It is, and uh, it is for constructor really, because if you know, we are we we didn't really perform that crazy uh, yet with the constructor and uh, this race would have been really good. I think we would have finished P1, P2 or P1, P3. Um, uh, huge points for the team. And after what happened, uh, of course, we already got it. Well, I want to say congratulations, but I appreciate it. It's very hard for you guys at the moment, but well done. Still a second place for you. Ariana. I hear you've got the winner. I have indeed. Lovely to hear from Barry and Tom. There's so much emotion. But right now we are joined by a driver who I'm sure is filled with Lots of positive emotions. Freddie, congratulations. Another race victory. How do you feel after that one? Thank you. Uh, it was a very intense race, so I'm still coming down from it. <laughs> I bet. It was a very action-packed, that one. Uh, can you just talk us through your opinion on how you managed to actually take the lead there that, with the move um, with Barry? Uh, with Barry, it was... I can't actually remember. Got a little spicy. <laughs> a little oh, bit of contact. Yeah, so... <laughs> I think Barry was slowing down to give uh, Nico a chance in front since the game put him on the wrong tire. Um, so I was just trying to avoid him basically and I went on the inside and yeah, that's it. Uh, there's some strong talent in the Red Bull family. Yourself obviously taking the race win. You had Tom Manley in third position and Josh of course having a very strong result in the top five as well. Things are looking good for the Red Bull family. Are they uh, hot on your heels, that young talent? Are they after your job? Yeah, I mean, I'm getting very old. Uh, <laughs> very old so, got to stay on top of my game. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, but you've been on your game now for so many seasons, Freddie. I mean, a heart back to your first win at Tor Rosso back in 2018 in the Azerbaijan Grand Prix. Uh, coming back here, first time to take two wins this season, and it's your second Dutch Grand Prix. Uh, looking ahead, chance for a championship? Well, there's always a chance. I think I should be in the lead now, so... But it's been four years in a row finishing second, so... You don't we'll want see. another one. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Great stuff. Freddie, you're one of the most talented drivers on the grid, as you said, consistently up there, consistently putting in good results. How do you manage that through the season, knowing that you're, you're consistently so good, but how do you push yourself to get that extra bit? Um, because we've seen it this weekend twice. <laughs> I don't know. I just do it. I just do it. I just do it. It just comes naturally. So how are you feeling looking ahead to uh, Kota? Kota, I have a better starting position. Uh, should have a good race pace there. Um, yeah, we'll see. It could be a mess again. Could be, but you've got a better starting position. It doesn't get much better than finishing first. So congratulations once Thank again. You. Thank you very much for joining us. It's time for us now to take a little look at the standings.
Yeah, let's take a look at the uh, driver standings after that result at the Dutch Grand Prix. And it is Freddie Rasmussen who leads the way 90 points over Thomas Ronha, who did not score in this race, 68 points, which means the gap then between those two is fully switched the other way. It's 22 points now in Freddie Rasmussen's favour. Jano Watmir, one point behind Ron here. Ronha on 67. A strong result in P2 there for Barry Broman, promotes him to P4 ahead of Ishmael Fassi. The reigning champion, Lucas Blakey, though, 47 points. Points scored today, though, with P6 but he'll be looking for more later on when he starts in pole position at Kota. Alfie Butcher with a great result in P8 and Danny Beresne not racing today still holds on to P9 with Josh Hedo in the Red Bull moving up to 10th position. Further down the field, Jake Benham, not, uh, not a good start to the race but he really recovered nicely there. P8 in the end getting some points. Tom Manley getting on the podium. Look at that strong talent at Alpha Tauri. Both Jed Norgrove and Tom Manley both on 17 points in 12th and 13th and at the bottom of the point scores we've got Fabrizio Donoso who on Fortunately, another driver who went onto the intermediate tyres instead of the dries, letting that race get away from him. Danny Moreno enters the grid, but is in 26th position after no points scored. And the constructor standings. Well, he's absolutely right. Freddie Rasmussen, runner-up on four separate occasions since 2019 in tandem, in fact. But his points now pushing Red Bull Sim Racing up to second in the team's championship. Just behind Mercedes, who, despite not achieving podium success this time around, having both drivers in the top 10, which has now uh, gone towards them achieving 126 points so far. Ferrari licking their wounds a little bit. They've broken over the 100 mark, but they must be wondering what what if, after losing out, after scoring a front row lockout after qualifying, McLaren still remain in fifth, Kick F1 Sim Racing remaining in fourth, Williams down in sixth, Alfie Butcher's points at Haas, moving them up to 39, 39 points, sorry. Well, there you have it. That is how things stand after our race in Zandvoort. Lots of emotion in this studio at the moment, I would say. I mean, it wasn't just from the Ferraris we heard. Things happening over here, things happening over there. It feels very uh, tense, emotionally charged. How much of that do you think is just that we're nearing the end of a really, really intense couple of days? Certainly, we've had, you know, three days in total, a lot of racing, a lot of qualifying going on. And, you know, you're going to have drivers who are later with results, but you're going to have drivers who are massively frustrated. And now it's really getting into the crunch time of the championship. At the earlier stages, whatever happens with the results, it's like, okay, I still have the latter races to kind of bounce back on. But when they start to fall away from you at this stage of the season, you know, catching up for the championship can be rather difficult. Not a good day for Thomas Ronha. I believe he was upset over there as well. Of course, you know, not surprised that the Ferrari were upset with that result, but we've got another race to go. So they have to get themselves in a right headspace now. Go away, get the music on, chill out a little bit and get ready for a race at Cota. Well, that's exactly it, George, isn't it? They've now got to reset and recharge ahead of Cota because... It's a blank slate at the moment and it's all up for grabs. It is. And um, again, um, despite obviously Rasmussen being the only driver to take two race wins, it's again, it doesn't change the fact that there's still a convoluted situation in terms of where the championship's going to go. It's yeah. not a foregone conclusion that Rasmussen's going to take the title at this point. But um, definitely making a statement by making uh, the moves that he did. Uh, obviously, we will have to wait and see whether there is any steward intervention uh, mm. coming into uh, later on this evening. But still at the same time, Cota is a vastly different track and it could present very different results. It could indeed, and we will get to see exactly what those results will be very, very shortly. But for now, we're going to take a breather from all of this uh, emotion and we're going to catch our breath. We'll be back shortly with some driver interviews and then we will return to go racing at Cota. Join us again.
Hello everyone once again. As you can see, I've managed to track down Jake Benham and we're going to have a little chat before we gear up for Austin. Jake, talk us through how you found that race in Zandvoort. Started tricky, but then you were on one. <laughs> yeah, it was a very tricky race. Um, I actually started on a dry setup to um, hope that it would dry up um, a lot earlier than what was predicted, which it did. Um, and then the medium stint, to be honest, was probably one of the best stints I've done uh, this game. Uh, I managed to make the moves when I did, uh, when I needed to, and it was a really fun race. Um, hopefully you can replicate it in Kota. Um, so yeah, really looking forward to that now. You were making so many moves, you were on the edge. It, we could all feel the energy from you. I was sitting just down there watching you, you could see how much it meant to you. What was it like in those moments as you're making those overtakes at a track that we all went into saying, so difficult? Yeah, it was um, quite a shaky moment, um, especially like going around the outside of Ishmael, um, like one wrong move and you're um, pretty much piling into a barrier together. So yeah, no, it's really exciting um, and hope it was a good watch at home as well. Yeah, it definitely was, it definitely was. And now we turn our attention to Kota coming up, the final race of this event too. How are you feeling for that one? Um, yeah, not a great quality, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, being promoted to 18th now, so... <laughs> Yeah, it uh, should Every hopefully be a counts. fun race. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, do, we're going to do our best again to gain as many positions as possible. And how do you shift the mindset when you are starting so much further back on the grid? Um, it's more about just playing the long game, I'd say. If you can make a few moves at the start, then all be it. But um, yeah, it's more about playing the long game, just seeing how, how the race progresses and see if you can make any moves um, in the second stint. Overtaking is definitely more possible uh, at Kota. What position are you targeting? First. No. <laughs> um, yeah, it'll be hard, obviously, but um, yeah, anything can happen. You've seen uh, some shenanigans with uh, other people sacrificing races and stuff like this. So, yeah, um, definitely not out of it, but obviously going to be a very hard race. All to play for, all to play for. Good luck. Thank you so much for chatting with us. Claire, I think you've managed to track down Brendan Lee. Indeed, Brendan alongside me. A happy Brendan Lee as well. You finished 10th in that race and you're starting 7th in the next race. A bit of points, you must be pleased. Yeah, three point finishes in a row now. Uh, Zanville quality was not ideal, uh, but Kota quality was a bit more ideal, let's say. Uh, was a bit more optimal rather than suboptimal. Um, so we gained five places each race in the last three races. So starting P7 should be a uh, good if I keep it going and we might walk home with some uh, I was going to say silverware but on this trend would be bronzeware wouldn't it but I don't think that's a saying well we can find you some cutlery or something if you're really into some silverware um, let's talk about the beginning of the race though obviously there was uh, some issues with the, with the restart with Ishmael Fassi being in the wrong uh, position but um, does that kind of take your mind away from the game or uh, you look cool and chilled and just chatting to everybody but do you have to reset your brain for that? I mean, I always like the compliment of looking cool and chilled, so thank you very much. Um, but I mean, to be honest, it's one of those things. And I don't understand what happened behind the scenes, but of course, something must have happened. But I think it's the same relatively in a different environment what happens in real life, maybe. Um, and maybe there can be a defect, let's say, with the starting lights. Uh, there can be a defect with... Uh, many different things around a circuit and of course a game is meant to be coded and everything's meant to be a bit let's say easier maybe in a game and less things to go wrong but stuff can go wrong i'm sure they'll do a let's say an investigation to what happened and go forward and yeah if anything was a good bit of tv <laughs> kota is a track that people can overtake yourself included but also you're going to get a little bit of heat from behind you uh, how <laughs> you might do it's going to be people on your tail i mean a bit of heat from behind me will go quite nice on a winter in the winter yeah i mean we're still a bit cold in the uk at the moment still a bit of rain still a bit of you know maybe two out of maybe two out of seven days in the week are nice a few months will be uh, seven out of seven. So Technically, we're going to be in Texas, though, which is warm. <laughs> wow, it's quite gusty there. And you can uh, get, if you get a cowboy hat, you don't actually feel the heat. So, uh, you know, there's a bit of argument either way. Where have we gone here? We were talking about racing. Now we're talking about cowboy hats. Let's <laughs> where, where realistically, then, at the, the end of this event, are you kind of putting yourself? Are you, are you quite pleased with your performance? Yeah, to be honest, I think, of course, we had the issues earlier on and what really affected the first load of qualifyings and the first load of races, but we came back really strong. I think uh, the team behind the scene did really, really a good job of supporting me, as I think I mentioned one or two days ago. Um, and 
I think my goal is to continue four point streaks in a row. Of course, I want to go forward. I have gone forward in the previous races. So lay it out on the line, see what happens and come back with uh, some silverware. And a bit of a fight back for Kick F1 in general for Event 3. Oh, of course, we're always pushing. We understand we went for some food in between the breaks and we was already debriefing and understanding what we can improve going forward. I think speaking openly for everyone in the team, uh, we, of course, want to be faster in qualifying. We see some areas that we can improve and we're obviously going to exploit those areas as much as possible. Absolutely, Brendan. Thank you. Good luck for Cota. Ariana, I believe you're with Fabrizio Donoso. I am indeed. Fabrizio, thank you so much for joining us. Zandvoort done and dusted, completed, another one in the bag. How are you feeling after that one? Uh, it could have definitely been better. Um, there were some uh, things uh, that didn't go uh, as planned and under, that were not under, under our control. Um, so, yeah, uh, a bit disappointed because I had a really good start of the race. Um, so it could have been so much better. The beauty of this event, though, is that it's now in the past time. It's straight into another race, which is coming up at Kota, obviously, very, very shortly. You're starting in a much stronger position. How are you feeling looking ahead to that? Well, definitely, I want to finish on a high. It's the last uh, race of the event. Uh, obviously, with the good qualifying I did, I'll, I want to move up and not backwards this time. Mm -hmm. uh, feeling confident with the pace. I mean, as soon as everything works on my side, uh, the performance was there on track. Uh, so, yeah, really much looking forward to that one. And in terms of the event as a whole, as I said, the nature of this is that you finish one session and you're straight on to the next one. We've had two qualifying today, two races, and it's been like that for the past couple of days. How have you found that as a driver? Uh, I think, you know, uh, the main thing to perform in these days is to reset after every session. I think some uh, drivers are better than others are doing that. I, th mm. I think myself, I'm quite um, easily, um, I can switch my mind uh, easily from an a session to another. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, you just got to take the sessions as they, as they come and um, trust yourself, honestly. That's, uh, that's, the, that's the key part. And in terms of looking ahead to Kota, competitive field, lots of people talking about wanting to make up places, lots of people eyeing up, of course, those top spots. You're already up there in the points when you start with. What do you think is possible? We know how close this can be, and a win can be in reach very easily if it's done yeah. right. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, uh, it's not a surprise for anyone who saw the events. Uh, anything can happen. People from me, literally the top, la the last five places can get into the points and even podium positions. Uh, so it's all to play for in the race. Um, all this obviously, starting from P6, uh, I can only dream of a win and a podium. Um, so it's going to come down to us and the strategy to make that happen. Well, we look forward to seeing how it goes. You can see all of the other drivers making their way back in. So we're going to let you go for a bit. So thank, thank you, you so much for joining thank us you. and good luck. Everyone will be back shortly to get qualifying underway at Kota.
Welcome back to the F1 2024 Sim Racing World Championship. We are gearing up for our final race of Event 2. And so far, Event 2 has delivered just about everything. Of course, we just went racing in Zandvoort and that delivered action, drama and a whole lot of emotion. And I'm really excited to see what Austin delivers, a track that a lot of the drivers are looking forward to, plenty of overtaking opportunities, opportunities to make up positions, so much to play for as they gear up for their final time to head out on track for this event. I cannot wait, but before we get into it, let's have a little look at how the standings shape up before Austin. In the driver's standings, we have Freddie Rasmussen, who has now managed to head to the top of the sheet. 90 points for him after winning in Zandvoort. Thomas Ronhaas sits behind him in second with 68 points, followed by Jano Otmi, just one point behind with 67. Then it's Barry Boromund with 56, Ishmael Farsi with 53, Lucas Blakely with 47. That's our pole sitter for this race. And as we can continue down, Nicholas Longay with 46, Alfie Butcher 39, Daniel Brezhnev 32, and Josh Edo with 29. As we continue looking down there, more of the drivers with a bit more of a gap to the top, bit more work to do. Jake Benham with 27 points, three of them then tied on 17. That's Jed, Tom, and Brendan. Wilson Hughes with 20 points, Fabrizio Genosa with one, Simon Vigan with one, and then we move to our drivers who are yet to score and will, of course, be hoping that this is the race where they can change that. And if we then switch to our constructor standings, Mercedes sit at the top with 126 points. That gap that they had closing slightly thanks to Freddie's win with Red Bull. Red Bull are now sitting second with 119 points. The Ferrari team jump up to 102 points. Kick now sitting at 85, McLaren 59, Williams 53, Haas 39, Alpha Tauri 34, and then a gap down to Aston Martin with two and zero points for Alpine. That is how things are standing at the moment. And now it's time to get into the interviews and it's time to do some chatting before the driving gets underway. I'm joined now by Andrew Clark from Alpha Tauri. How are you doing? Very, very well, thank you. Yep, it's been a really, really good week. It has indeed. I've been loving every single second of it. From your team's perspective, talk us through it. How have you found Event 2 so far? To be honest, it's been a really, really strong week for us. Um, you know, the, the races are so competitive between all the all the drivers. It's very, very tight out there. But considering it's uh, Jed and Tom's first um, first year in, in, the, in the championship, I think they've done fantastically well. Super proud of the boys, all of them. And uh, obviously with having... Uh, Yoni there as well with that experienced calm head. It's so important to keep the team on the level. Oh, it's so lovely to hear lovely words there. Um, what is it like having two of the rookies in the team? That must be uh, quite intense, but also hugely exciting. It's fiery. It's <laughs> definitely, they keep me on my toes this week, the boys. But it's honestly, they're, they're so fast. It's yeah. so good to see. And to the, for them to be so competitive in their first year against some really seasoned pros here, I'm so pleased for them. And as I say, Yoni's right there, always there. Things haven't quite gone his way this week, but I think he's going to come back in event three with a big, big bang. Oh, well, we love a bounce back. We absolutely do. Um, let's turn our attention to today. Let's talk about Zandvoort, which is, of course, now done. But how do you reflect on the race? Zandvoort was a chaotic start. A little <laughs> I'm not bit. sure what happened there. But <laughs> when it got going, yeah, we were really happy with, with the pace throughout. To hold off uh, off the Mercedes was, was really, really strong for us. That's exactly what we wanted. Um, and to finish with Tom on the podium, you know, I've been telling him all week, it's going to come. He's going to get it. He just has to keep believing. And, and it did. And yeah, we're so happy for him. It absolutely did. Huge congratulations Thank for Tom. You. He's been on fantastic form this week, yeah, I have to fire. say. He really has yeah. been on fire, really up there in, in the moments that it counts. Yeah. Uh, quick word on Austin that we're looking forward to now. Well, the boys obviously starting a little bit further back yes. uh, in this race, so they're going to have to make some moves. I've told them both, go for it. Simple <laughs> as that. Elbows out, go and race. Make sure you bring some points back for us. Oh, I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. No well, I can't about. wait to see that. No messing about <laughs> at all. Go for it. Claire, how's it looking on your side? Fighting talk down there? Oh, always fighting talk, I'm sure, from Brett Kosh. He is the team coordinator at Williams. Have we got some fighting talk going on at Williams? Oh, 100%. Um, going into this race, you know, around USA, we've got uh, Ishmael starting from the back and uh, Alvaro um, making a return to get that Q3. Um, it's, this, this is definitely a big day to fight. 
A big day to fight. Yeah, we've seen lots of fighting up and down and actually throughout the whole event so far. Um, let's have a look at the event as, as a whole. Um, three days of racing. We've had... Uh, five races so far this is the final race that we've got before we go to event three in a couple of weeks time how do you assess so far your whole event um i will say i think you know going into the event um we were really confident you know we, we had a uh, really good pace we have had faced uh, we have faced some challenges uh, throughout the event with alvaro getting ill yeah. um but i will say that it has actually led to us you know being able to really support the drivers in the right way um, about that human performance side and also making them feel more ready to race. Um, so I am I'm very proud of the team, you know, for how we've managed this week. And they're very racy drivers, aren't they? They like to see if they can find their way around drivers, you know, pull off the move that we go, how did they get around there? Both of your drivers have that kind of flair about them. Yeah, 100%. I think um, something that in F1 sim racing, you know, over the past seasons, um, it became more apparent that maybe that kind of racing wasn't a thing anymore. But uh, I think, you know, Alvaro and Ismail uh, have proved it wrong completely. Are we looking for podium positions here? You're going to have to fight pretty hard. Look, um, I think we're going into the race with uh, quite a calm head. Um, we've prepped correctly. Um, but what I will say is, you know, we're always up for that challenge. We're always going to going to try and reach that perfect result. Circuit of Americas, it's going to be fun out there. Oh, plenty of overtakes, plenty of racing. We love it. <laughs> plenty of overtaking, plenty of racing still to come. But we did have qualifying earlier today, so let's get a few highlights of who is on pole position. Groove from fifth place, Blakely goes, his, goes to the top, further down to no so. Super happy to finally pick up a pole position this season. Yeah, it's been an intense couple of days, so to you know start the final race of the event on pole position um, and pick up a point for that as well, uh, yeah, feels great. I'm just super happy to finally have a Q3, you know, on the, especially on the final run, you know, nice and smoothly. So yeah, big thanks to the team for you know helping me all the way through it. 20 seconds left to get all of these drivers across the line. I think there's going to be people that aren't going to make it. We're down to 15, 14, 13. You've got to be very careful through this, this section. It's so easy to make one mistake at the beginning of this section, and that will throw you off throughout its entirety. Uh, it's a tricky volley. Yeah, we managed to just pull out a good lap in the end. It was really hard to put every sector together, but we, we managed to do it in the end. So From fifth place, Blakely goes, his, goes to the top, further down to no so moves up to fourth. And look at how much it means to Lucas Blakely. Great to see that little recap there. But now it's time for another little chat. We have with us Gregory Balaji from Alpine. How are you doing? We chatted yesterday. How are you feeling today? It was a tough day. Uh, even yesterday was not easy for the drivers. Qualifying guys improved a bit. We have uh, had a cute three in on vote for Patrick. Kota, we missed it slightly because Patrick invalidated his first run. But pace is there. Confidence is getting there, even if the days have been really tough in the race. But we are here to fight. Uh, we are all on equal cars. We are all here to try and do the best every day. So we are going to fight until the end. We've seen some real flashes of uh, real pace, as you said, though. Patrick looking really strong at points. Yeah, Patrick has been really solid in qualifying. He's a strong point. He has proved that he is there. Uh, and I'm really happy of what he has delivered. Like, it has been a bit, of, a bit relief uh, for the team. And uh, this is like definitely like inspirational, let's say, to continue to push. Even if the start of the season has not gone in our way, it doesn't mean that uh, it's finished for us. There is plenty of race left and we just have to fight every time. Absolutely, plenty of time still to build back. We've still got a whole of event three to go. Um, looking yeah. ahead to Kota, starting a little bit further back down the field, but how are you feeling? This is a track that has opportunities. So we are starting from P14, P15. Uh, it's a good enough place to try and get to the points. We have seen all the year that on F123 you can win yeah. from any position and have big results from any position. It will all depend on strategy and who will be on which tires at the start. So it's going to be really tricky. Kota is known to be an exciting race for F1 Esports. It has always been like decided on the final laps. So we are waiting for a lot of action and chaos. And uh, we are ready to see what is going to happen in the race. And uh, I think like we can aim at good things.
Love that. Uh, you mentioned their action chaos. I think Event 2 has had a lot of both of those yeah. things. There's been a lot of emotion, a lot of drama exactly. across the field. What has it been like for you guys in the team to have that level of emotion? I mean, when you're in a LAN environment, it's all so much more palpable. It's a bit like frustrating at some points because like, you know, if you miss your qualifying, you're like, oh, but you could fight for the pole or for a better position and then a better race after that. So you need to just continue after that, not think about it and think about what is in the moment. Um, and also like for the races, we've been quite unlucky like at the start yeah. with uh, front wing damage and the carnage that we can't avoid, but we also need to improve qualifying to avoid that and uh, it's going the right way to try and find our way back in the points. And in terms of the drivers and how they've been dealing with everything, um, it's been so full on, how are they? They're feeling like a bit tough, obviously, after yeah. all this happened, but I know they are not quitters. Uh, they are literally the opposite of that. I know they are fighting. They know how hard it is when it's not going in your way, but they also know that when it gets back in your way, you can build something out of it and get better results. Well, absolutely. And that is exactly what you guys will be hoping for. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Good luck for this one. Oh, I think there's enough talking. I think the talking is done and dusted for the final time in event two. I think we are ready to go racing. Round seven is set with the state of Texas, the destination. Welcome one and all to the Circuit of the Americas for the Formula One Sim Racing World Championship United States Grand Prix. Set on 1,500 acres in the rolling hills just outside downtown Austin, it plays host to its fifth Grand Prix on the F1 Sim Racing Championship calendar. Who can forget 2018 when Brendan Lee would claim and cement his legacy as a two-time world champion, winning at this circuit with Mercedes. And last season, where fellow two-time world champion Jana Watmir would go on to lay down one of the greatest F1 sim racing performances of all time, whilst also driving for the Mercedes team. It provides something for everybody with a wide track width and high variance of corners, the w well, certainly to wet the whistle of any racing enthusiast. And here we take a look at the circuit. Slight elevation changes out of the first sector, heading down into sector two, mainly from the hill, leading up through towards turn one. But it's a 5.513 kilometer circuit, 3.426 miles, plenty of throttle, plenty of action, plenty of DRS available, and long straights to boot as well. As we're about to jettison around, let's take you through the starting grid from back to front. Ishmael Fassi starts from P20 on the grid. Spaniard Danny Moreno starts in 19th spot. Moving on up, Jake Benham starting 18th with Yoni Tormala in 17th for Alpha Tauri. Next up, 16th place going to Ulash Oz Yildirim in 16th at Ruben Pedreño in 15th alongside him for Alpine. 14th place goes to Patrick Shipos, fellow Alpine driver. Nicholas Longay as well for Ferrari starts in 13th, looking to bounce back from Zanvoort. Tom Manley in 12th. John Evans starting in 11th place. Good qualifying session for him. Very nearly made it into Q3. Alfie Butcher in 10th with Josh Edo, the Welshman, starting starting from ninth in P8, further up the order. It's Jarno Otmier bidding to become a three successive race winner here at this circuit. Three times a race winner would be lovely. Brendan Lee joining him on the same row of the grid as we alluded to, the first winner here at this track in F1 Sim Racing. Fabrizio Donoso in sixth, Thomas Ronha in fifth. Second row of the grid goes to Alvaro Caraton, a season's best performance from him in fourth, with Barry Burraman starting in third place. Moving on up to the front row, it was stellar, wasn't it? Freddie Rasmussen thought he had it done, but our previous race winner starts from second. Lucas Blakely on pole here for this United States Grand Prix, but it become a race winner for the first time this campaign. 
And taking you through all the action is myself, George Morgan, joining me in the commentary box, the one, the only, Hayden Gullis. And Hayden, this is an exciting one. We alluded to the fact that this circuit, we've got light cloud, 90 degrees, 66 degrees Fahrenheit. It, it's looking like we're going to finally have a dry race after the deluge that we have had pretty much through event two. But we have got a lot to look forward to. Yeah, we certainly have. Whilst you were giving us that fantastic intro, I was about having a little look at the driver's perspectives, and it will be dry throughout this whole race. And here we go, folks. The lights now all lit. Five lights lit. And it's pedal to the metal. And it is go, 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 go. Lucas Blakely in front of you, Rasmussen. Leave together. Rasmussen, though, might have the best opportunity. He's got the inside in towards turn one. Threatening Blakely now as they hurtle down the hill, wheel to wheel. But Blakely still with the advantage. His nose enough to retain the lead of the race. Barry Burman in third. Alvaro Caraton remains in fourth. Brendan Lee and Thomas Ronha making up a kick up one sim racing double axe midway in the top 10. Lots of different tyres throughout the field, including the front two. We've got Lucas Blakely, the leader on the hard tyres. Freddie Rasmussen on the soft, so he's going to be trying to hunt them down. But Lucas Blakely needs to hold position, defend as hard as he possibly can, neutralise the advantage that these guys on the soft tyres have to try and give him the best shot at this race when it's only softs and hards throughout the field. And there you can see it on your screens with Patrick Sipos further down the field on the soft tyres as well. He's going to be looking to try and get through the field. Lucas Blakely now being overtaken by Freddie Rasmussen. They're wheel to wheel. Barry Borman's getting in the mix as well as Lucas drops a couple of positions. Yeah, Lucas Blakely now forfeiting a couple of places. Could lose three, in fact, now as Alvaro Caraton sticks his front wing into contention for a podium spot, at least for now. Still early days, and Caraton ruthless in his pursuit here. And he's not alone, because Brendan Lee chucking the kick. F1 eSports car up the inside, and as they take the triple right-handers now, Brendan Lee committed, as he now looks to try and take down the reigning F1 sim racing champion, and has done so brilliantly. Lucas Blakely now heading of the hard runners here in this stint, but Rasmussen, as he was towards the end of Stanvoort, he is now back in front and he's looking to persevere, but there's plenty of hopefuls in behind and look at this for context. Barry Burman in second place, once again behind Freddy. Yeah, these two are going to go battle once again. Hopefully, they can keep it clean this time around. But a fantastic move there from Brendan Lee, doing exactly what he needed to do. He's on the softs, he has the better tyres, and he needs to stay on the train of these front runners. Now those four. They need to run away from the rest of the pack, try and build that gap as much as they possibly can in order to give them the best advantage later on in this race when they, of course, switch over to either the medium or the hard tyres. Lucas Bakey, though, sadly for him, he tried his best to hold on to the lead and stay within that pack. But, of course, the inevitable happened. He's on weaker tyres, he's on the harder compound and has had to uh, relieve those positions over, of course, to that top four for the time being. But it's not over yet for Lucas Blakely. He needs to hold on to that one second window. Try and stay on the back of those drivers. We've got a little battle going on. Alfie Butcher trying to make his way through the field. He's currently running right behind the Aston Martin of John Evans. We'll be looking to move up a position. Of course, Alfie Butcher starting this race in P10. So he's lost a couple of positions already in this race, and he'll be looking to get back up the field. Always opportunities heading in towards turn 12 as the drivers filter out from it. Alfie Butcher, though, not able to uh, certainly make the move. It didn't look like he wanted to, though there was one driver making moves, and that was Nicholas. Longe, a little tap on the rear of Alfie Butcher. I think it was more the side pod, in fact, maybe even the rear left tyre, but uh, Butcher still retains P12. Hasn't lost any shape. Uh, certainly no concerns, at least for now. Still on the back of John Evans. Uh, Evans having a decent qualifying session, Hayden. Arguably unlucky not to break into Q3. Qualified 11th anyway, still holding that place. And um, the way the strategy is lined up, he's on the hard. Should he stay in DRS contention, it could go his way. Yeah, certainly so. You've got Patrick Sipos on those soft tyres. That's the main reason why John Evans hasn't gained a position, because, of course, he's ahead of Alfie Butcher, who started this race in P10. Patrick Sipos is making a move now, moving himself up in a P7. Of course, he's on soft tyres as well, so he's going to need to try and get past those guys. And that could really help out Alpine's race. If he can get on the back of Brendan Lee, so that when they make that round of pit stops, he can stay with that pack that makes the undercut, it could help him in this race, of course, to get Alpine their first points for the season. As they wind their way through sector one, it's such a tricky section, so easy to pick up. A few track warnings here or there, and that's going to be the important thing come the end of the race. Don't pick up three of those and make sure you don't get a penalty. Absolutely right. Rasmussen out in front. There's Burman, who we're currently riding on board with in the bottom right-hand corner, just as they were back at the Touch Grand Prix. Only a race to go, in fact, as they now hurtle down towards turn 12 in behind Alvaro Caraton with the current fastest lap of the race. Of course, expected on that initial run on soft tyres. Uh, it could yet uh, go to somebody else as the track looks to warm up with the cars now plummeting through it as they make their way in towards the entrance to Sector 3. Further back, 
Blakely still remains in fifth, but what I will say, has lost DRS to Brendan Lee. Yeah, certainly has, and that's just the deficit that the hard ties have over the softs at this time of the race. He needs to get a move Correction, on. He has but, oh, he's got it back oh, in. Okay, okay. You're, looking at, you're looking at the wrong dates. That's okay. Uh, four <laughs> seconds, four tenths of a second is the gap. You got me, you got me nervous there, John. I'm sorry. That was gap to leader, <laughs> not gap to friend. <laughs> Apologies, folks. And Lucas Blakely still hot in P5, still within DRS contention, of course, and Patrick Sipos flying on those uh, soft ties. He'll be having Thomas Ronha in his sights. Yeah, there's still a little bit of a gap between those two, four tenths of a second, but he'll be looking at, of course, the, uh, what was the championship leader going into today? That is now, of course, Freddie Rasmussen after the race win last time out at Zandvoort. But he's right on the tail and looking to try and score those first points for Alpine in this race. Jan Orbit, the two-time champion, always does well around Kota. Currently in P10 for the time being and has moved up a couple, has moved down a couple of positions, sorry. He's in P8, of course, for those drivers who did start on the soft tyres, jumping him. Yeah, no fears for Blakely right now. Fifth place and still within half a second of Brendan Lee in front of him, Ron Hart in behind. And it's very key that they can keep Patrick Shipos in behind them too, just to avoid any issues in terms of how their strategy is going to unfold. The last thing they want is to get into a battle and Patrick Sheepos, given the aggressive nature, he's likely going to want to make these moves happen. It will advance the tyre wear, as you can just see him there dodging to the inside of Thomas Ronha, looking to try and make the move through turn 12. And they're going to run wheel to wheel through this segment as well. And he's not alone, because Alfie Butcher doing the same on John Evans. Evans now in the bid of losing a place and moving down to 12th as Butcher tries to take 11th away from him. And he has done so, and now chasing Jana Watmir for a chance at a point position in the top 10. Patrick Sheepos is not able to complete the overtime take on Thomas Ronha has to remain in P7 for the time being but Alfie Butcher great move there on John Evans John tried to defend the inside line but the time that he moved over to the inside Alfie Butcher was already there and he had to allow the door open for Butcher who stepped right in and moved up into P11 in this race he's right behind the two-time world champion obviously a fantastic uh, debut season so far for Alfie Butcher we've had strong performances in qualifying a race win as well as uh, there was a Ferrari just moving out of the slipstream having a look on the inside of John Evans John Evans day might not be done Nicholas Longay very aggressive after what happened in Zambor. Yeah, Alfie Butcher currently watching on screen now, making his way through the Magnuson Beckett-esque section of circuit in Sector 1 here at Cota. We have a replay of Thomas Ronha. Now, this was the moment. Beautiful switchback on Patrick Sheepos, who was trying to take the place away from the Dutchman. Remember, Sheepos on those soft tyres, but Ronha countering it in a truly remarkable fashion, getting that switch back out of turn 12. Certainly so, and Patrick Sipos just needs to get this overtake done as soon as possible, because those softs are going to drop off. Once they get past that 25%, he's kind of utilised the best of their ability, and the hard tyres will start to become the tyre of choice in this race. We're going to really be able to tell when that crossover period is, because those hard tyres will be starting to make moves and look right on the back of those soft tyre runners. Nicholas Longay having a look now on John Evans. We saw these two battling on earlier on in the lap. Nicholas Longay though squeezing John Evans to the outside of the circuit and John Evans has to yield and slip down into P13. Yeah, we saw the raw emotions on Longay's face after the previous event, at, well, the, the previous ra round in uh, Zandvoort after it all fell apart during the pit stop phase where of course he was placed on intermediate tyres as opposed to the slick tyres that he was looking for given the drier conditions appearing across the Dutch Grand Prix track, but now this time is looking to alleviate that pain by trying to achieve a top 10 at the very least here at Cota. As they now peel away out to the final corner, they'll ascend up through towards turn one and then back down the hill again, reaching the highest point of the circuit as they make their way once again through that slalom section very shortly. Rasmussen taking them through it now with Buramand in behind. Caraton having a decent run so far, and this could be perfect for Williams right now because, of course, further back is Ishmael Fassi, who is actually last of the running cars right now, which is, of course, where he started the race. Lucas Blakely on screen right now, our retaining champion, winning it in 2022. Fifth place at the moment, started from pole position, but of course on the hard tyres, allowing him to slip down a few positions. But let's see what he can do later on this race. Has a look up the inside there, Brendan Lee, slight tag, and I think he got away with any front wing damage. Was put under pressure there from Thomas Ronhart, having a look, and of course the two kick cars very close to each other. Maybe just trying to sandwich Lucas Blakely, trying to get the best out of him. Thomas Ronhart aggressively moves over to the inside just to get that clean air and cool down his engine. Yeah, so now head through this next left, and once again heading through into the final sector looking to bid an end to lap six of 28 Rasmussen still in control of the pace see a few cars starting to fan out uh, in certain areas you can just see there Blakely just taking differing lines in certain areas going a little bit wider than perhaps Brendan Lee is maybe a little more conscious Brendan Lee of Blakely 
at this stage because we know how good Lucas is. And, uh, of course, you'd expect great things from someone who is a former champion. His, the season prior, he was in contention for a title as well, just narrowly missing out towards the latter stage of the season. Many actually projected him to be actually be a favourite during that campaign. And uh, I myself actually thought he was one of the favourites to do it as well. But uh, the next season, he had to wait for it, but he got it eventually. It doesn't look like so far, though, that he's going to be in contention unless he gets that vital race win in his locker, of course. Remember, starting pole here at Kota, he has every chance chance to still take a, a first race win here this campaign and at least try and mount some sort of a challenge to Freddie Rasmussen like many of the drivers are in this 20 driver grid that we have. They have a very very strong position to do that later on in this race he's going to be on the best tyres available but he has to charge through the field it's all going to be about how well he can perform overtakes and move through this field to try to take back that lead of the race which he had of course at the start starting from pole position he's really squeezed in behind uh, the kick car of Brendan Lee and then also has Thomas Ronhart right behind him as well not too much margin left between those two watching from the rear end of Freddie Rasmussen Barry Borman moving to the inside just to get that clean air no sign of an overtake from him because he's too, just too far back there's no need to lunge it from that far away just calling the engine just to make sure he still has that top end speed later on and not put too much damage onto the engine of the car but uh, Freddie Rasmussen leading the way and of course if he finishes in the lead of this race he will get 20 points to his name putting him well over 100 and certainly certifying himself as the championship leader with uh, Thomas Ronha the lead chaser at the moment he's down in P6 we need to make sure that Freddie Rasmussen does not do that and that Thomas Ronha gets the upper hand to get this championship back on track after a, a couple of disappointing races there for the kick driver he led from such a huge margin to over 20 points and then just sadly the last couple of races have just all fallen away from him but he's sitting nice and tightly behind Lucas Blake at the moment these two the front runners from the hard tyres, they're going to benefit from the strategy later on. But it's all about when these guys come into the pits as well. Because you don't want to go too early, because if you go too early, you know, that advantage might fall away from you later on with that strategy. But of course, if you go too late, you can allow those other drivers to get the undercut on you and be ahead, of course. So they have to time it to perfection. And I'm sure their strategical team, their engineers behind the scenes, are going to be doing all the calculations to make sure that they get it spot on. Yeah, as we move in now into the first sector and soon to be in the second sector on lap 8 of 28, just beyond a quarter uh, of this race so far as well, signed, sealed and delivered. Patrick Schipos uh, currently standing behind Thomas Ronha, still holding on now at this stage to the fastest lap of the race. Ronha, uh, the gap between he and Blakely, as well as he and Schipos, relatively similar. Nothing separates them now, as you can just see them clustering up coming out of turn 12. There's Buramand, who has now got the lead away from Freddie Rasmussen, uh, heading out of that initial sector and has taken it away from the Great Dane, who will now wait in the wings. Now, this could be a sign that maybe they're preempting a pit stop, because yeah. Buramand will be looking to lead heading into the pit. Yeah, burning the battery just to make sure that he utilises his charge there, because you get battery performance back in the pit lane. So he's going to be burning that, trying to get ahead of Freddie Rasmussen, potentially coming into the pits. We're lap 8 out of 28 in this race. The softs have been on for a while. Will Barry come into the pits? No, he doesn't. He just fancied actually just being in the lead of the race of this, uh, of this US Grand Prix. Didn't fancy Freddie Rasmussen holding him up instead. Instead, he wants to be the leader. He wants to dictate the pace of this race, and he is going to certainly do that as they head down to the first corner now. Freddie Rasmussen just has to file behind him. Alvaro Caraton, very strong performance. Was ill yesterday, of course has bounced back and is currently on the podium. Yeah, it is indeed resilience here from Alvaro Caraton after uh, staying back uh, or staying away from the simulator with Will Lewis being applied instead for the Williams team. Caraton now returning and uh, it's been a season best performance so far. We'll be hoping to see if he can hold on to this podium. It would mean a lot to the Spaniard who has been part of the championship now ever since 2018 where he was indeed drafted to Williams Esports. One of their uh, senior figures as a driver despite still being a very young man at the wheel of his simulator as they now make their way out of this next left-hander so to begin the trip down the DRS straight out of turn 11 in towards turn 12 the rear wing open once again this time on Thomas Ronhar as he looks to try and get closer to Lucas Blakely Freddie Rasmussen just having a look down the inside of Barry Burramand no move there could be made further back Brendan Lee also getting tighter with Lucas Blakely in behind him and Ronhar pushing him around into this latter sector now as they look to make their way very shortly around the triple corners I'm looking at Patrick Schipos right now I get a sense of trepidatiousness now because Donoso is all over his rear wing, Hayden. Certainly, he's going to be trying to hunt him down. Obviously, the soft tyre is not working to their full advantage anymore. 
And it's been a bit of a slow race so far, this one. Everyone's well behaved. No one really wanting to go for an overtake. And Jano Otmir spoke earlier. He said that, you know, it's not really worth going for an overtake in these races because the marbles build up on the car. And, you know, the marbles are just that dirty side of the track that's not on the racing line. As you can see, Fabrizio Donoso right now, he's on the racing line. If he were to go over to the left of that track, he'd start to pick up marbles on the car. As he hits the brakes, he just doesn't have as much grip as he would have if he stayed on that racing line. Patrick Sipos just moving a little bit under braking and out of the corner as well. So Patrick Sipos showing that those soft tyres probably falling away from him well past that 25% stage. But if the hard tyres will also get to 25% at some point as well. And that, that neutralizes everything across the field and no one really has an advantage. All the tire performance is completely plateaued and they're all in an even playing field. Although the soft tires will just be slightly better. Yeah, just look there that um, the grip was failing. She passed a little bit coming out of turn one and Donoso might get his chance. Uh, he's right in behind she passed right now, three tenths. Uh, within three tenths, in fact, the gap as they head out of turn 11 this time around. Just breaking out of the aero, Josh Edo as well, just in behind Donoso. And uh, Jana Watmir, who currently sits in P10 himself. Barry Burman still out in front. Does Rasmussen plum for the move just yet? He got in close, just did not quite get himself in a position to make it. Alfie Butcher pushing along Jana Watmir. It got very tight and very fraught down at turn 12 and they're in behind Nicholas Longay now looking to try and land a blow as well you see the red marker just below this time as now we see Jonas Gilderim taking on the other Alpine of Ruben Pedrenio as once again Butcher under pressure from Longay who is still feeling hurt no doubt after what happened at Zandvoort last race around as we now see them make their way through the final few corners Longay threatening Butcher did well to defend yeah Butcher fortunately had the inside line going through that uh, triple right hand was able to defend that position a lot easier but a great will to a moment between the two of them. The two Hasses getting a little bit racy out on track as uh, they both went side by side. As you can see, the up and down position changes so far in the grid. So Barry's up to. We've got our uh, one of our biggest fallers, of course, the pole position man, Lucas Blakely on uh, hard tyres has dropped down four positions, but that is to be expected because, of course, those guys on the soft tyres have just got far much, far much superior grip uh, in these earlier stages of the race. Of course, it was going to be easy for those guys to get past. Patrick Sipos has had a fantastic race so far from those softs, gaining seven positions, but just needs to make sure that when they make that round of pit stops that he is within a second of Lucas Blakely so that he can stay onto the lead train and not get dropped. Yeah, she passed now, uh, getting closer to Thomas Ronhart, so maybe is finding something out of these soft tyres in this initial stint. Maybe there is some life left in the Alpine. Donoso, though, looking to come straight back at him, might even look to upset him, heading down through towards turn 12. There we see them now, further back. You can just see there, she passed just slowly edging out of the aero, further back as well, once again. Uh, Yulash Zildirim getting caught up as he now meets Pedreño in a battle for that 15th place. And I think Zildirim has managed to get him finally. Pedreño, the Spaniard, down to 16th. Certainly so. One Alpine falling through the field, but the other, Patrick Sheepos, we're watching on board with at the moment, P7. He's having a very solid race at the moment, as we said before. Alpine, zero points so far to the name. Another team at the bottom, though, is Aston Martin. Fabrizio Donoso has one point so far, so does Simon Weigang for the team. Only two points to their name. And they, they will come. be looking to try and get some points on the board. And as you said, George, here they come into the pit lane. Barry Borman, Frederick Rasmussen and Patrick Sheepos all into the box. Yeah, indeed, Barry Borman will lead uh, his rival, Freddie Rasmussen, into the pit lane now as we see more cars making their way up through towards turn one. So as it stands, Caraton staying out. He's got Brendan Lee for company. Lucas Blakely in third place. Thomas Ronhard down in fourth with Donoso also giving chase in fifth. We have certainly got a stellar lineup in this top ten made, out, uh, made up of a group of young drivers that are making their debuts this season with also veterans that are going to come back to the forefront once again this campaign as we now see them pushing each other through this initial sector Thomas Ronhart under pressure from Donoso who got him very tight before they descend down into turn 11. Thomas Ronhart nearly losing that one second DRS advantage there but just about stay within that one second of Lucas Blakely. Interestingly enough Ishmael Fassi has come into the pit lane. Now Fassi did get a free place grid drop to put him at the back of the field, was at the back of the field and was also on hard tyres, wasn't like on the other guys on the softs. He's also opted for the medium tyres to take himself to the end, but he's four seconds off the pace. Now he needs to burn the battery as much as possible. We've got a will to a battle, Tom Manley and John Evans. Tom Manley on the inside of Evans there, now around the outside through this right-hander. Evans is going to hold it though as much as he possibly can, but Manley now with the inside, slight bit of contact. Good save there from Manley. Oh, Evans can't try it around the outside and switching it back though comes Ulas having a look on John Evans though. 
can't quite get that manoeuvre done. But yeah, Ismail Fassi moving on to the medium tyres now. And he's going to have to really burn that battery to try and close up. Four seconds is the gap between him and Patrick Sipos. Patrick Sipos now within the DRS of Frederick Rasmussen. Needs to stay there to try and tow himself back up through the field as we've got Alvaro Caraton and Brendan Lee into the box. Yeah, Brendan Lee and Caraton coming into the pits. Now, it'll be interesting to see where Bruman comes out in all this. He was 10 seconds disjointed off the pack. Well, 16, in fact, if you factor in as well, he's got to make his round through the latter sector. There's Bruman now, and indeed is your net leader of the race so far. So applying, shall we say, the undercut strat in all of this with Freddie Rasmussen locked in behind him, keenly enough as they make their way through the next slalom, the left and right, before then hurtling through the latter stages of sector one. They've got, of course, Brendan Lee now, who's rejoined the circuit. Caraton also out too. And uh, the good news for Caraton is that he is ahead of Lee still and still remains very nearly just in touch of DRS of Patrick Shipos, who currently sits in 17th. Yeah, someone who's performed a great undercut here is this Malfast. We've got a little battle here. Fabrizio Donoso flying up through the field. Second place at the moment as Thomas Ronha has lost out a couple of positions. Maybe a mistake or a little bit of contact into the hairpin before the back straight because he's won from second place now down to fifth. Swallowed up from Fabrizio Donoso and Josh Edo. Somebody who needs to run away right now is Lucas Blakey. The gap extending now to two seconds. He needs to get on with this race as Fabrizio Donoso moves himself up into second. There's not just battles at the front of this championship, but also at the back. It's very important that Aston Martin pick up as many points as possible as they're in a battle with Alpine for who doesn't finish last. They're trying to fight for that ninth position in the championship at the moment. But watch out for Ishmael Fassi with this undercut as he is right now on the back of this train. Yeah, Josh Edo uh, coming into the pits. We've got some of the hard runners now coming into box. As now we see them all make their way up through towards turn one this time. Four cars deciding to do this. Of course, Thomas Ronhart coming in, as is Ruben Pedreño. Danny Moreno uh, also making his way uh, through as well into that pit bay. Um, we can now see the rest of the cars now filtering onwards. And indeed, Barry Burramad after losing out to Freddy Rasmussen. Rasmussen now with the net lead of the race so far here on lap 14 of 28 as Bruman comes through the first sector into the slalom. Uh, Shipos starting to flash on the back of his car as well. What has happened to Thomas Ronhart in this race? Because he's fallen right down to the back of the field on the medium tyres. Now two seconds off the pace of Danny Moreno. Not a good day for Thomas Ronhart. Potential damage? All. Potential damage, certainly. Must have had a front wing change in that, uh, in that little collision when he lost so many positions. And unfortunately there for Thomas Ronhart falling through the field. This event looked like it was going all Thomas Ronhart's way at the start. You know, he had some great performances, but the last three have all just fallen away from him. And this championship is falling away from him as well. Notably, though, those hard tyres still staying out at the moment. A few of them deciding to box, but uh, for Lucas Blakely, he thinks he's going to stay out for now, wait for a little bit later, so he has some incredible medium tyres, or even maybe some soft tyres under his belt. Yeah, we now witness Tom Manley making his way through as well, as they make their way through the triple right-handers and uh, will do so with Barry Burramand as well making his way through. Shipos in behind him, still plugged into the back. Shipos has done well to recover some of the delta that he had indeed lost. Burramand plugged into the back of Rasmussen, knows that he has only one mission on his mind as two more cars come into the pits. Ulash Ozildarim and Fabrizio Donoso coming in off those hard tyres and they will now, I'm sure, stick on a set of the medium tyres. Now, what I'm wondering is, you've got Blakely and Otmir, Alfie Butcher, Longueret in front. How many of them do you think will take their hearts as long as possible to end on the softs? I think so. I think Lucas Blakely at this stage, it's too late to kind of make that switch onto the medium tyres because if he does so, he's going to fall right down the field. Look at those guys who are in the pit lane at the moment. And even Ishmael Fassi, great undercut, put himself up into 14th. On the back of those guys who were, of course, fighting nearer the front of the field, Patrick Sipos, you know, in what is a net P3 in this race. But Blakely, of course, going to take this as long as possible. Going to the softs. Otmir, though, two-second gap to Lucas Baker. Don't think he's going to be able to close this down. Blakely really, you know, gained from that squabble that was going on between Thomas Ronha and uh, Fabrizio Donoso and Josh Eder and those drivers allowed him to extend away but will it be enough to help him get this race win only time will tell Barry Borman fighting with Freddie Rasmussen going to the inside he wants to be the leader of this chasing back or are they just working together to try and make sure that Lucas Blakely doesn't come and get him took the words right out of my mouth this could be an attempt to try and avoid getting attacked by those jumping onto the soft tyres deep into this race. They know that Blakely is considerably ahead of Jana Watmir and doesn't have any concerns in terms of being tracked by DRS. So Blakely, by all intents and purposes, does have a clean track 
to work with here as now Rasmussen makes his way through the triple right-handers coming out of turn 16, 17 and 18 through turn 19. Butcher now comes in so we have got our race leaders now coming into box as we now see Rasmussen curtailing through the final corner, leaping after Barry Broom and out in front. Jake Benham now making his way around the circuit in front of the lead contingent with Yoni Tormler in second place. But further back, in they come. Blakely, Otmir, Butcher, as well as Longay, Manley in the mix as well. But indeed, I think they're all plumbing for those medium tyres. Yeah, time. Lucas Blakely going on to the medium tyres. Just going to show that I have absolutely zero game knowledge there because Lucas <laughs> Blakely on the medium tyres now and uh, not opting for the softs that I thought he was going to do. There are still 12 laps left to go, but he's going to massively utilise those soft tyres. He's got four laps advantage and he's definitely going to be able to try and use those in that latter stage of the race. Those guys that went on to mediums earlier on, they're going to reach that 25% point a lot earlier than Lucas Baker is, but he's going to have to make moves. Look at where he is out on track. P12, that will become P10 once those two drives come into the pits, which of course is Jake Benham and Yoni Tormela. So uh, Lucas Baker will be looking to try and get himself through the field. There's a big gap between this lead pack at the moment. Barry Borman, Freddie Rasmussen, Brendan Lee. Brendan Lee looking like in strong contention for a podium here. Patrick Sipos has had a fantastic performance, but look at the Williams. Alvaro Caraton, of course, qualified right up at the front of the grid. He started P4 in this race. Ishmael Fassi started right at the back and now is in P8. There is a four second gap though between those two drivers and Fassi will be hoping to try and close up to those guys. But unfortunately, I think because they boxed all at the same sort of time, it's going to be difficult for him to close up that gap. The one mis option Mercedes have with Jake Benham leading the field is to perhaps leave Benham out uh, and maybe try and... Well, maybe not, because he's just boxed. He's just pitted, in <laughs> fact. So there we are. Forget I said anything. As we now take a look at uh, the replay, Ulas and Gilderim are currently seeing on screen as well. Brendan Lee uh, also trying to make moves past Patrick Shipos as well. Uh, of course, we witnessed that battle unfold out on track as we take a look further up. This, of course, being uh, the one involving Fabrizio Donoso and Ruben Pedreño uh, heading down in towards turn 12. Quite a bit of action starting to come about here on lap, while well, heading into lap 17 of 28. There's Shipos now, just in behind Caraton, with uh, Fassi now 4.1 seconds in behind that crew. So still a chance here for Williams to do uh, perhaps something really special here. Fassi has thrown himself right into points contention. Blakely on a mission. Currently sat now in ninth. Remember, he started on pole position and is now trying to work his way through the top 10. He's beaten past Pedreño, and next on his list is Fabrizio Donoso. Certainly so. I think this could be a difficult race here from Ismail Fasti. Of course, he boxed at the same time as uh, the rest of these, these guys at the front. But uh, four seconds off the pace, it is going to be difficult to close up. So, does Fasti start to play that team game? Does he start to hold up those drivers to give the guys at the front the best advantage of staying ahead of those guys doing the overcut here. Alvaro Caraton, his teammate, currently in the top five. It will give him a great opportunity to fight for this race win. If you keep the likes of Lucas Blakely um, and also Jano Otmir as far away from him as you possibly can. We'll have to see how that one plays out over the rest of this race. Just over 10 laps left to go of this Grand Prix at Texas. Jano Otmir, we're watching him at the moment. He's in P13. Alfie Butcher is ahead of him, managed to get the undercut on the two-time world champion. These two are very close together earlier on in the race, but Jan Watney will have those fresher tyres, and he just loves an overtake around the circuit, doesn't he, George? He does. Alfie Butcher overtook him on the previous lap, though he's just taken the fastest lap of the race. So the pace is with Butcher right now, who's looking to ascend and chase after Moreno, uh, who holds on to 11th, uh, just mere footsteps away from breaking into that top 10. Uh, Butcher, of course, leading that Haas contingent in his debut year, and a maiden visit, a debut visit, the United States Grand Prix in Formula One sim racing conditions. It's now Freddie Rasmussen starts to try and close up to Barry Burman. Of course, these two have been swapping the lead now, left, right and centre in a bit to try and prevent Blakely from closing up to them here. But the good news for Blakely is that there is a DRS train. Donoso now looking to ascend as well as he breaks away ahead of Ishmael Fassi moving up into seventh spot. Fassi though might have the DRS heading down the long straight and also enter uh, Lucas Blakely as well who's looking to bring himself into the fight. Fassi now looking to try and double back this time against Donoso. Blakely's going to go down the middle as they head in towards turn 12. Fassi now up the inside. Here comes Lucas Blakely who's going to try and get the pair. Oh that could be sensational. It could be brilliant. They make contact. They remain side by side. Blakely with the inside though. Coming through the next left hander. What about Donoso? He falls in behind it's Lucas Blakely with a superb surprise attack as he makes his way through the triple right-handers.
put that in for contention of move of the season. That's a, that's why he's a world champion. Lucas Blakely, absolutely fantastic. Donoso and Fassi scrapping away, and it's cost Fabrizio Donoso a track warning. Three of those, and you get a penalty. He'll want to avoid that as he's in good points positions at the moment, especially in that battle with Alpine. Alpine, of course, in P5 right now, so they're going to want to try and get as many points as they possibly can. But wow, what a move from Lucas Blakey there, right around the outside, switching it back. Brilliant stuff there from the world champion, and he is on a charge to try and take this race win. He has a little bit of clean air in front of him now. Josh Edo is up the road by about a second. He's going to have to burn that battery to close back into that one second, reel him back in, allow Josh Edo to pull him along for a little bit, save the battery slightly, get the overtake, and then go on the charge for that top five. The good news for Blakely is that Edo does not have DRS, uh, so he can close up to him rather quickly. The only downside is that it does mean that it separates him from the top five. So even if he does make the move, he's then got to burn the energy again to get within one second of Shifos ahead of Edo. It's now Tom Manley, who we run on board with in a battle for P16, now looking to break Thomas Ronha, who has had a very difficult race and has fallen down the field once again as Manley now moves on up. Remember, he scored a podium last time out at Zandvoort. Not quite the same scenario here this time around, but we're only on, only on lap 19 of 28. Nine laps left in this race, if you factor in this one as well, as they now venture through this next left-hander. We've got a scrap in between Jano Opmir and Ishmael Fassi. Through the triple right, they go. Butcher and uh, Opmir have been tussling as well earlier on. Of course, we're watching Butcher make his way through the double left-handers, but Opmir with a major moment heading through the final sector. This was Blakely's move. Let's take a look back then. As we're watching now, this is actually no Danny Moreno and Alfie Butcher fighting Apologies. around with Ismail yep. Fassi as uh, Alfie Butcher took 10th position, Danny Moreno in P11 and Fassi in P12. Jana Watmir trying to get amongst that as well to move further through the order. And they're scrapping away still, this time with Eulis and Danny Moreno. Jana Watmir's moved up into P11. We've got Danny Moreno trying to hold position, but unfortunately Eulis with those better tyres able to get past him and moving up into P12 in this race. The front pack though, trying to stay ahead of those guys, but they're being reeled in. Lucas Bakley, he's overtaken Josh Edo. We've missed that one, but Lucas Bakley has moved himself up into P6, and now he's only 1.4 seconds away from hunting down that top five. And I'm sure once he gets back onto the back of that train, which he almost is, it's 1.2 at the moment, as Nicholas Longe moves past Fassi. Unfortunately, Fassi boxing just a little bit too early, unable to catch up to the train. I thought it was a very smart idea from Williams. They really tried to push to get onto the back of Patrick Sipos. Unfortunately, missed out by I think what was about half a half a second there and unfortunately for him he's falling through the order with those dead ties in this race but Lucas Bakley 1.3 seconds really trying to rein them in they moved away a little bit in that section of course because those drivers did have DRS were able to be pulled along that back straight but now he is within that one second and he is on a charge yeah Danny Moreno's efforts heading in towards turn 12 was almost a carbon copy of what happened with Lucas Blakely only a moment or so prior to that hence the confusion confuse anybody I suppose in that <laughs> instance but yeah incredible as we now see them venture through the final couple of bends Ishmael Fassi who is now behind Tom Manley uh, there you can see Nicholas Longe as well further up this race far from concluded though Barry Brumand still holds the lead advantage Rasmussen bidding to become a two-time winner in succession and a three-time winner overall this season as now we see more battles as Longe and Moreno come together out on the outset of turn one Longe now in 13th with Moreno 14th We've got Manley, John Evans in 16th, two, with Fassi now into 17th, two. Blakely, uh, of course, now in the battle for Edo. This was the move that we missed earlier on on Josh Edo. Blakely managed to, managed to pull it off for the McLaren outfit. Yeah, no need there for Edo to fight that too hard. Although, you know, he is trying to maybe help his teammate, Freddie Rasmussen, so maybe he could have put up a bit more of a fight to help out Freddie. But, uh, yeah, unfortunately, would have hurt his race even more. Patrick Sipos and Lucas Blakely going side by side now as they go down the back straight. Blakely will have DRS. He will be ahead of Patrick Sipos. He'll be able to break later, having that extra grip from having three lap younger tyres. And he does move up into P5. Further back, we've got Ruben Pedrano fighting with Fabrizio. Donoso there and they're going will to will in the background as you can see now this is John Evans uh, who is just, cu just currently just ahead of Danny Moreno keeping that position Fabrizio Donoso and Ruben Pedrano still fighting it away for that P8 position and uh, we're going to see whether that con it continues over the rest of this race but that battle has cost them the DRS it's 1.1 seconds I'm sure they still have battery to their name to try and close up the gap but if they can't then this 
and this little train is going to break away from the leaders. Yeah, Lucas Blakely back in contention, though. The DRS train back in formation as Ishmael Fassi goes on the hunt. Currently staggered in P20. Seven laps to go, and uh, he'll make his way around now this time as we now witness Lucas Blakely back on the attack. Pedreño also attacking Donoso. Alpine with two cars in the top ten here, and with a great chance to take double points here in this stage of the race. Truly magnificent as Alfie Butcher now looks to try and fight up against Fabrizio Donoso, heading through the S's section in sector one here on lap 22. As they now bust along through, Donoso still waiting in the wings. Butcher may have won this round, but we're now witnessing now oh. the two, with well, the Williams and the McLaren of Lucas Blakely trying to take on the Spaniard Alvaro Caraton in a battle for fourth place. Blakely can almost smell a podium. There's every chance. He goes late on the brakes in towards turn 11. Can't quite find the action, but still, as he now puts the power down, an opportunity perhaps presents itself with DRS. The only issue is Caraton has DRS himself. He tried to spook Alvaro there into the hairpin, tried to make him, you know, react to Lucas Blakely's lunge. It was aggressive, and luckily they did not come together. Great scenes there from Alfie Butcher working his way through the field. We've seen some incredible one-lap pace from him, and now we get to see some incredible racecraft as well, as he's making overtakes, moving up into P9, and now on the of Pedreno. As you said, both Alpines in the top 10. Patrick Sipos, great strategy from, from him to uh, put himself in that position. But now Ruben Pedreno trying to follow through Lucas Blakely and Josh Edu as they're trying to hunt down those front runners as well. Lucas Blakely on the back of this uh, leading pack at the moment and he needs to get past these guys as quickly as possible because the longer he takes, the less life these tyres are going to have. And once he gets down to 25%, then he's you know pretty much used up the best of his tyres. It just kind of plateaus, so we have very similar pace to the guys in front. Whilst their tyres you know, will be slightly worse, it won't be by enough of uh, an advantage there for Lucas Baker. Zulas moves past for Richard today, so another drive who maybe just boxed a little bit too early in this race and is now unfortunately falling down the order, down to P12, and it'll be look looking like Nicholas Longe trying to get an overtake on him. And Nicholas Longe working his way through the field as well quite nicely. He'll be looking to get himself into the top 10 to kind of redeem himself after the misfortune uh, in the last race in Zambor. But here's the battle up at the front. Alvaro Caraton staying nicely tucked up behind Brendan Lee. When is Lucas Blakely going to make that lunge, going to make that overtake to try and get himself and break that top four? We'll soon find out. Caraton getting closer and closer to the back of Lee. He was very nearly pushing him through the first sector here at this stage. Big shame for Fabrizio Donoso as he was looking to chase for more points for Aston Martin. As all the cars now hurtle down through towards turn 12. Barry Brumman still out in front with Frederick Rasmussen still locked into second. Alfie Butcher now down the inside of Ruben Pedreño trying to defend against the Alpine who still remains in the top 10. But Butcher in P8 and looking to chase after Josh Edo here in a battle between Haas and Red Bull as they come through sector three this time around. They're all starting to concertina up, all within DRS, stretching all the way back to Thomas Ronha down in 19th place as they now stretch around the triple right-handers heading through the latter two corners before they then venture onto lap 24 of 28 and with four laps left to go Burraman could be only steps away of securing and matching Freddie Rasmussen's, Rasmussen's account of two race wins this season. Following Alfie Butcher on this charge is the two-time champion Jarno Otmir as we've got a bit of darting going on around the track of course just to cool down the engine and make sure they don't get into that uh, TX. It's just going to overheat the engine, you're going to lose the top speed and that's of course not what you want around here especially with those long straights. But Jarno Otmir currently in P10 needs to get a move on. Ruben Pedreno showing a little bit of vulnerability as those tyres are slightly older than Jarno Otmir. So Otmir will be looking to try and move past him as soon as he possibly can. Two laps younger tyres there. Be looking to follow Alfie Butcher and then see what they can do on Josh Edu in this race as well. Lucas Bakley had such a charge to get onto the back of this top four but is unable to break it at the moment. Whether he's just biding his time knowing that those guys tyres are going to get to a really bad state by the end of this race that he can then pounce in those last two laps. But uh, Lucas Blakely just sitting behind for the time being. Alvaro Caraton moves to the inside, partly to defend, also partly to cool down the engine. And Lucas Blakely still having to just sit back for the time being with four laps left to go. Yeah, certainly the composure of the Great Dane is Massive as now Pedreño looks to try and tag back on Alfie Butcher. They're going to run wheel to wheel, heading through the next double right-hander. They've got another left to take, which will be the hairpin, which could present an opportunity for Otmir, who smells blood here. And now the Flying Dutchman trying to launch it around the outside. It'll become the inside. Come the triple right-handers. They run wheel to wheel, as do the Williams further up as well. As we see them all bunching up together, it's Otmir now, who moves ahead of Ruben Pedreño and now chases after Alfie Butcher for eight. Lucas Bakley had a slight look there on Alvaro 
Karatone, they went side by side, but Alvaro perfectly defended to hold that P4 position for the Williams car and defending very, very well at the moment. But it's surely only going to be a matter of time before Lucas Blakely pounces and takes away that position. Once he gets past him, he'll be looking and setting his sights on the podium, of course. Picking up a penalty, unfortunately, Nicholas Longay, his day gets from bad to worse there as a penalty is surely going to knock him out of contention for points in today's proceedings. But uh, we're watching on board, Rim Fratino. Having a great race. P10 at the moment, in the points. Two points positions for uh, Alpine at the moment as Lucas Blake is still sizing up Alvaro Caratoni. Just trying to work out where is that Williams weakest? Where can I make that overtake? Sitting behind him for a few laps now, he's been able to sort of size him up and see where is the best opportunity to make that overtake. He's trying it into sector three. Will we see that once again? Of course, the DRS zone utilizing the ERS. Let's see where we can make a move this lap around on lap 25. The laps are ticking away. Yeah, they are ticking away indeed, and with three laps to go, and we've got many cars now looking to go wheel-to-wheel -wheel once again. Jake Benham, uh, this time down the inside of John Evans. Tom Manley just ahead of them too, as they still remain side by side. Heading through towards the latter sector, Benham is going to try and hang it, just so he can have the inside heading through back in towards the hairpin. He certainly will have that, the All-Star, as now John Evans has to try and tussle, try and battle him back, as now the Aston Martin, powered by Mercedes, has currently sped on ahead. 15th place now as Jake Benham loses out. As we now ride on board here with the replay from Caraton. Yeah, Lucas Blakely having a look up the inside. That corner is so wide on entry that it invites you to send one up the inside, but then you lose out. You don't have the inside line for the triple right-hander. And Alvaro Caraton was able to defend that, carrying the speed on the inside. And Lucas Blakely had to back out for the time being. Lap 26 out of lap 28. We're going to have three full laps left of this race as Nicholas Longay is getting a little bit feisty further down the field, fighting with Fabrizio Donoso and moving himself up into P12. Ulas is up next, but of course he does have that three-second time penalty that he will need to watch out for uh, in this race now. Uh, further up from the field, Barry Borman. It's been quiet for him. He's not really done too much in this race, apart from the, the, the chopping and changing up at the front between him and Freddie Rasmussen. But since then, he's led the way and he's led very comfortably. Yeah, Nicholas Longay with that penalty. It's not going to be ideal. It hasn't been a great day at the office as far as Longay is concerned, especially after what Ferrari could have hoped for in that previous race where they had the lockout. Since then, though, it's kind of gone slightly pear-shaped, but they've still got Burrowman up at, up at the front. Longay, I'm sure, will be back in event three without any shadow of a doubt. As now Rasmussen once again has a look down the outside, heading in towards turn 12. As now Lucas Blakely once again trying Caraton, heading through now into the latter sector. He knows he must do it now, switches back, and has a look down the inside now as the McLaren looks to tackle the Williams as they run wheel to wheel. Coming through the final sectors, now moving through turns 14 into turns 15. Blakely now up to fourth, and now a podium lies in wait. But first of all, he needs to try and take down a fellow champion as the Alpine of Patrick Schipos looks to try and raise his stakes. Alpine need this. They know they do. Caraton, though, forcing him back. Off the track he goes, but Schipos can't defend the place. And through goes as well, Josh Edo. And through goes Alpi Butcher. Uh, Patrick Sipos edged off the track there by the Williams driver of Alvaro Caraton. A little bit of contact between Lucas Blakely and Alvaro Caraton. Just cost the Williams so much time and allowed Patrick Sipos to have a look. And they just got a little bit too feisty with each other. And unfortunately, that opened the door for both of these drivers who are on much better tyres to slip on by. Alfie Butcher, P6 now. Josh Edo in P7. They all need to stay in the train at the moment. But it's eight tenths of a second for Alvaro. That gap is coming down. He's closing up to Lucas Blakely. Lucas Blakely now right on the back of Brendan Lee. A champion. Champion, of course, a two-time champion in 2017 and 2018. will be looking to try and move himself onto the podium. The win might have gotten away, but there is still plenty of time to try and sneak up some, some try and sneak in some overtakes. Yeah, penultimate lap of the race now in full swing as they venture through turn 11. There's Jana Watmir ahead of Patrick Schipos. Now the Mercedes ascends. He's now got a Red Bull in front of him. Josh Edo, the Welshman from the Ronda Valleys. Now looking to try and hold on to yet again another top 10 placement for the Red Bull team. Freddie Rasmussen chasing bigger dreams as he looks to try and clamber onto a third race win of this season's campaign. Jake Benham alongside John Evans as they look to make their way through. And uh, Yulasha Gildrem also trying to break into the top 10, but first he needs to displace one Alpine with another Alpine stacked ahead of him here as well. There's two Alpines currently sat 9 and 10. 
obviously on the cusp of achieving at least minimal points here at this this leisure of the race. John Evans and Benham still together as well, tying up as they have done over the last few laps as they head through the final corner now to turn 20 and rise up the hill to begin the final lap of the race. And it's set between, the scene is set between Burrowman and Rasmussen as it was at Zandvoort in our previous round. Rasmussen looking for his third win, Burrowman chasing his second. Round three between these two then. Let's see what can happen as we go on to this final lap of the race. We saw it last season four drivers scrapping away for the win right down to the wire and of course Jana Watmir came out on top in that one so don't count out Lucas Blakely just yet he does still have the better tyres and he's right on the back of Brendan Lee the gap so small between these guys are they all going to have DRS on this final lap where does Barry Broman use the ERS where does he use that defensive surely it's got to be down this straight Freddie Rasmussen must have battery in abundance to so go for the overtake on this final lap can he pull it off let's find out Certainly well, heading down the long straight. This is Rasmussen's chance to strike as they head down now towards turn 12. The Great Dane ushers in the overspeed, working for him. Barry Burman knows he's in trouble. Rasmussen's got him. He leads here on the final lap at the Circle of the Americas. And here in Texas, a great chance for the Red Bull team to usher in a third victory. And the helm of Freddie Rasmussen, who at the same time will increase his points gap at the front of the order in terms of the Drivers' Championship. And it'll only help their team's championship as well, as for the final time, they hurtle through the triple right-handers. Barry knows where he, when he's beat this time, because he's encountered one powerful Great Dane, who on this day, the final day of Event 2, is going to round the final corner. It's a magical number three for Freddie Rasmussen. He wins the United States Grand Prix, and now moves and tightens his grasp on a potential championship but first and foremost, it's event three next. That's going to set him right up at the front now. Give him a total of 115 points with that race win for Freddie Rasmussen, taking a massive charge in the championship, especially as his closest title driver, Thomas Ronha, way down in P19. Jano Watmir also not highly scoring in the points. P7 for him. So it is a fantastic charge from Freddie Rasmussen to take that lead. Lucas Bakley, unfortunately, just left it too little, too late. Unfortunately, unable to break that top three and move up the order from him. Further down the field, great day for Williams. Unfortunately uh, for Ishmael Fassi, unable to bring it home after that uh, undercut there. But a team that would be very, very happy with the points they scored today is Alpine. Patrick Sipos in P8, Ruben Pedrano in P9. That is going to move them above Aston Martin in the Constructors' Championship and off the bottom. They're off the mark finally in the F1 Sim Racing Championship. Freddie Rasmussen still just taking it all in, taking in the emotion of that race win a fantastic drive from him to overtake Barry Bermond. Unfortunately, Barry knew he was beat at the end of that race. No sort of defensive maneuver to take the inside line and to even try and hold position. And very happy for Brendan Lee, who managed to get a podium in this race. He did it last season in 2022. I'm pretty sure last season in 22, that was his last podium as well. But Brendan Lee, absolutely over the moon with that. Fantastic drive. He's had some really good performances over the last two days and uh, showing that, you know, maybe it's not all Thomas Ronhart in the kick team because, of course, that's how it was over the first three races. But uh, Brendan Lee, very very, very happy with that, and the team are as well. Yeah, that's his fourth podium here at Cota as well. He took victory back in 2018, which saw him win the championship, as we all know. And then onwards from that, he was third in 2019 and a third again in 2022. Well, he's just gone and taken third in 2023. What a record. But who can stop this man, Freddie Rasmussen, in this event dominant, taking three wins through the course of it since we got started earlier this week and now sets the scene perfectly for him as we move to event three in a few weeks' time. Truly sensational. What a performance. He gave it absolutely everything. Ariana, that was special. That was special, and I think he must be feeling very, very chuffed. What an event, too, for Freddie Rasmussen. Another victory. We weren't expecting that. We were talking so much about all the different winners we've been having so far, and then Freddie said, uh, no, actually. Change the game. <laughs> yeah, certainly. It looks a bit more like Lucas Blakey was going to have that, especially as we noticed that the charge and the, the fresher tyres it was going to have coming through the last stage of the race, but unfortunately just reached that 25% far too early, and it just halted him. The great defence there from Alvaro Caraton to hold him up, and I think he was just that, that cork in the bottle. Stopped him from making that charge and hunting down the front runners. Really helped out, though. Brendan League, of course, yes. getting that first podium in such a long time and uh, I'm really chuffed for him. I'm glad that he got that result.
We saw lots of emotion from him. He was coming over, hugging Barry, cheering. It's super happy. It must mean so much, right? Yeah, absolutely, Ariana. I've got to say, I mean, uh, jumping out of that, um, Rick, I can only imagine the emotions. Some of his best memories have been here at this Cota circuit. He's just added another one as well. You have no idea, I'm sure, we don't, certainly as, as pundits and commentators, just how much it means to these drivers, especially when you're Brendan Lee, a former champion. That could galvanize your entire season. I mean, we could see a different competitor come event three. He might be the imposing factor at kick now. Maybe it's not Thomas Ronhart. Maybe it's time for Brendan Lee to rise. Maybe it is. Right, let's have a little look at these uh, results. <laughs> the results, shall we? Talk us through them. Let's take a look then at the provisional results after the United States Grand Prix. Freddie Rasmussen, it's two out of two today for him. He takes the race win and is on the top, leading the championship, of course, as well. Barry Berman finishes in second, unfortunately, unable to do what he did against Lucas Blakely yesterday in Spa. Had to concede position on the last lap. Brendan Lee with a first podium in quite a while, but he'll be chuffed with that result. 15 points added to his name and Lucas Blakely, the reigning champion in P4, unable to convert that pole to race win. Alvaro Caraton in fifth, Josh Edo in sixth, Yano Watmir, the two-time champion, finishes in P7. Patrick Sipos and Ruben Pedreno, great result for the Alpine drivers. They get off the mark, six points total for them, and they move up above Aston Martin. Alfie Butcher got a three-second time penalty at the end, but still managed to finish in P10. Tom Manley outside the points in P11 with Jake Benham as well, P12. Further down the field, Danny Moreno on his return to F1 Sim Racing. Sadly, once again, no points for him. And a really bad day for both Nicholas Longay and Thomas Ronha out of the points here in the United States. Yeah, tough day for those guys, definitely. We can also have a look at who got our DHL Fastest Lap Award. And it is Alfie Butcher. Alfie Butcher managing to grab that lap 17. He managed to get that. Very well done to him. That's an extra point in the bag for him. Very nice indeed. Now, let's hear from our P2 and P3 finishers with Claire. Yeah, alongside me is a very, very happy Brendan Lee from Kick F1. You look pretty comfortable out there. Yeah, it was all right. I, I would say it was a Sunday drive, but I think it's Friday still. So pre-weekend drive, pre-weekend pre -weekend drive. I think we've lost all like knowledge of the days or the weeks here. We've had six races, six incredible races as well. And you have rounded it off by getting your first podium of the season. Yeah, I think... It's, of course, a really nice feeling. We managed to race really well. We have Bowery behind the camera who did a really... I was watching him the whole race, trying to understand if I could get a move into P2, but he did a fantastic job as well. Also, Freddie, but I also want to give credit to the team. Uh, of course, they did a lot of preparation behind the scenes, and I, of course, said a lot of stuff in the start of the event, but we came back strong, so I'm really happy for that. But I think I also want to give a really big credit to the organizers, you know, because... I don't know how much I can say on the camera, but we had a lot of uh, stuff behind the scenes, what was happening over the last few months, a lot of uncertainty as social media knows, so I could probably say stuff on the camera. Um, but coming back, they really smashed it out the park. And I don't know how many people there are somewhere upstairs in a room somewhere, but I'm sure there's many, 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 many people that I want to thank. If I can't thank them personally, I want to thank them here because the future was uncertain. But now they really smashed it out the park by bringing us back to LAN. And I mean, the organizers of previous years have really done a fantastic job. But this is the best LAN experience, personally, I've had so far in terms of the organization. And one improvement. One improvement, though. There's, we have like this jar of like chocolates outside and they have bounties in them. And it's disgusting, G genuinely, it's disgusting because they don't have the Malteser one. They don't have the best ones, but they have a bounty. They have a Snickers. I like a Snickers. I mean, it's acceptable. It's really good. <laughs> exactly. All right, we'll pass that. We'll pass it on. We'll make sure you get better snacks. Will be, you be happier then for event three? Oh, much, much happier. Like, okay. I, I have to say, at Christmas, New Year, you don't reach for the Snickers first. You reach for the Malteser, and then the bounty is always left over for the uncle, aunt, or someone like this. But, I mean, it's true. It's true. I'm not going to lie. I like a Snickers. Hey, look, congratulations uh, on your podium, your third place here. Uh, you must be elated. I'm going to let you run off and go and enjoy some time with the team. And I'm going to bring in Mr. Barry Borrowman, who's currently speaking to Alfie Butcher's father at the moment. Come on over. Well, you fought hard out there, didn't you? It was just at the end that you were beaten by Freddie Rasmussen. But after everything that's happened today, a consolation prize maybe, and still more points, important points for you. 
Yeah, first of all, I want to say GG to Freddy. Um, I, I really knew that I, wa I wanted to stay P2 because then you can save tires. But when I see Lucas' strategy, we couldn't really slow down because then we would help Lucas. So I was like, if I slow down, then it, maybe, I get Lu uh, maybe I get Freddy, but then Lucas will catch us. So I just pushed like fully and I, I knew that last lap would be so tricky because Freddy saved so much tires. But at the same time, you don't want to take any risk because then Lucas was behind, Brennan was behind on a better tire. I will still take P2, but of course the, the thing I didn't understand from today was the Zandvoort incident between me and Freddy. I just don't understand how stewards didn't uh, give him a pen. It was completely pushed to pass. I, I can't really understand it. it. I would have finished P1. Um, I still, uh, we wanted to appeal it, but they said it's uh, NFA. Uh, I don't understand it. And uh, genuinely, I have no idea because whoever I asked for and any team in this, um, in this uh, championship, of course, except Red Bull, they said it's 100% pen. I have no idea how we didn't get pen and it was really questionable. Frustrating, I know, for you. And there's been a couple of frustrations throughout the, the whole of the three-day event. But let's have a look at the whole event for you. You've got to be proud of yourself. You've got to be proud of how the team performed. Yeah, I am. I'm a little bit gutted for my teammate, of course. I know how does it feel. First day, I had the same. I scored like one point. Of course, I got a pen in Austria, but I, I scored only one point. I knew how does it feel being literally one of the fastest and just always like wing damage, unlucky. It, it's actually so hard, this championship, like mentally, is it's so bad like uh, right now i'm completely just ready to to go to bed not gonna lie but i'm sure he's really fast we have uh, we're gonna put more effort and i'm sure we're gonna come back stronger barry go and get some rest go to bed and go put your shoes on please uh ariana i think you've got the winner I have indeed. Freddie is back at the desk. Another win under his belt. Congratulations, Freddie. Thank you. Nice to see you so soon. How's it feeling? It's nice to end the event on a good note. Of course. I mean, it's more than a good note. It's fantastic that you got both victories today. Yeah, the first one was a bit iffy, a bit lucky because of uh, Longe going on the wrong tyre. Um, but this one felt more deserved. Oh, yes, certainly. It was a fantastic, fantastic outcome for you. How does it feel to end the event two on such a dominant, dominant way? Oh, it feels good. How does the team feel? They're all very happy. Celebrating? Yeah, they did an amazing <laughs> job. The ERS management throughout the race was uh, probably the strongest point. At what stage of the race did you decide the best bet for you to take the race win was to stay behind Barry and wait until that last lap? Uh, at first, I thought me and Barry could work together, pull away from the rest. So I pushed, um, pushed for the lead after the pit stops and tried to pull away. Spent a lot of ERS, um, but then I saw it wasn't happening. The others were too close. And then, yeah, I didn't have ERS, so I stayed behind Barry and saved. It's a very busy schedule here, of course, having you know six races within three days. Is your experience of being in the LAN events and being in F1 Sim Racing for such a long time the reason why you are leading the championship by such a long way right now? Uh, I think everyone here can, can do well. Uh, maybe it's an advantage. I have a lot of LAN experience. But yeah, everyone is very talented. I don't think I have a very big advantage for that. Yeah, I mean, Freddie, uh, I mean, that's a, a stellar performance. Uh, and at the same time as well, your third race victory, you're the only driver now to have multiple race wins this campaign. Uh, many would call it dominance at this point. Obviously, we still have a third event to go, but things are looking good for you and Red Bull right now. Obviously, on one level, great to win the driver's crown should you achieve that in event three, but also the quest for the team's title as well. Yeah, I'm not sure what the standings are right now. I have to look how far the gap is but it's looking good for another P2. Brilliant stuff. Well, we look forward to seeing whether you can do that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us up here, Freddie. Make sure you go and enjoy celebrating tonight. Fantastic result for you, you this weekend. Thank you very Thanks much. So much. Let's have a little look at those standings that Freddie mentioned. Talk us through them, guys. 
Here we go then, the provisional driver standings after event two. It's all wrapped up and Freddie Rasmussen leads the way. 115 points to his name, a whopping gap there over Barry Burman, who's really excelled in the latter stage of, it, of event two. Now moving him up, himself up into second place ahead of Jano Otmir by one point. But what a gap that is between first and second. 30, uh, 35 points between those guys at the moment. 36 points between those guys. Thomas Ronha currently uh, in P4 on 68 points. My maths is terrible. I've got that completely wrong. But let's just skip past that. Don't worry about it. Lucas Pakey in P5. He is the reigning driver's champion. 59 points, though. It's going to be a big, long shot and a fantastic event. He's going to need an event three to try and retain his championship as well. Fassi had a strong start to event two, but it kind of fell away from him in the latter stages. He's in P6 with Nicholas Longe seventh. Alfie Butcher is in eighth and Josh Edo in ninth. And Danny Perez, who did not race today, still retains himself into the top 10. Further down the field, then we've got Brendan Lee after that podium. That puts him up to 11th place in the standings, just shy of the top 10. Jake Benham in 12th. And then the two Alpha Tauri drivers of Jed Norgrove and Tom Manny, 17 points to both of those. Wilson Hughes in 15th place on 12 points. Both Alpines scoring points today in the United States Grand Prix. Patrick Sipos now 17th. Ruben Pedrano in 18th. Six points total for those guys. And then it's the two Aston Martin drivers. Fabrizio Donoso, Simon Weigang, our last drivers to score points. And on the final page, it's all the non-point scorers. They will not want to look at this page, but hopefully they can score some points in event three with Danny Moreno picking up the rear and in 26th place. And let's have a little look at our constructor standings at the end of event two. Yeah, and uh, just like that, Freddie Rasmussen, you have done the business. 152 points now for Oracle Red Bull Sim Racing. Just ahead now of Mercedes, who have been dropped to second off the back of Freddie's victory. Ferrari still chasing in third spot as well, with Kick F1 Sim Racing team in fourth place. McLaren Shadow remaining in fifth, Williams Esports in sixth. But we've got to look down because Alpine have ascended. They are now up to ninth after Patrick Shipos managing to pull the points in with Ruben Pedreño. Six points go to them, with Aston Martin now sat at the back in tenth spot. Thank you both very much. Now, I want to have a quick word uh, about Ferrari. Uh, how do we describe today for Ferrari? Heartbreak for Nicolas Longue, such a difficult day. Barry having some good showings. I mean, P2, fantastic, but not able to break away from the heartbreak from the team. Yeah, I, I think certainly from that first race, you know, they had a one, two. They were working fantastically on the strategy to build that gap up, to do the double stack, to both hopefully be in contention for a one, two at the end of that race. And then the misfortune of being put on the intermediate tyres, despite the drives being selected, throwing that away from for Nicholas Longe. And of course, that race as well, uh, stepping away from him too, getting the penalty, dropping down to P18 at the end of the day. And I want to correct myself, the points is 41 between the two. Okay? <laughs> I did maths in the end. I did manage to get it in the end. <laughs> <laughs> we got there eventually. We got there. Now, we just touched on Nicholas Longe and the heartbreak that he's had. Claire is with him now. Yeah, I have Nicholas Longe alongside me. Nicholas, it's been such an emotional day, but we have another event to come in a couple of weeks' time. How do we move on from this? Uh, I don't know. I've, I don't think I've said a word for the last two hours. Um, I'm sorry if I get emotional. It really means a lot to me, this championship. I've put a lot of hours and weeks, months of preparation into this. and um, To lose it like that in it hurts a lot. Um, Due to a fault of the game, not of my own. Um, there's nothing I can do there. Um, and it was just hard to, to jump on, on Kota for the second race. Um, I tried my best, um, but unfortunately I had some wing damage with a collision. So I couldn't do anything um, in that point of view. But still happy for my teammate Barry that secured two P2s. Um, I'm sure we can uh, can work together in the event three even more. Uh, I know it, it looks really bad right now in the championship um, but we still have like half the races to go so nothing's possible i will try my best and um yeah i will work, I will work even harder we will yeah we will see you fight back and we know we will and the strength that it took for you to get into that sim today and race as hard as you did you've done some incredible racing throughout this whole event you must be so proud of your own driving style things that aren't in your control you're going to have to just put behind you for now but for yourself you really really were strong out there yeah i tried to give it my best um also really big thank you to all my team my family for supporting me through this. Um, Tiziana here, doing everything that she can. I love her to death. My parents, just everyone. So big thank you to them. I'm sorry that I can't really speak properly. 
Uh, yeah, I'll just go back home, have a good night's sleep, and start preparing for event three. I'm going to let you go off and hug someone because I might do it for myself a minute. So go, go, go. Uh, Nicholas Longay, obviously incredibly emotional after all of the events that's happened today, Ariana. So hard to see. I mean, such a difficult pill to swallow when it's completely out of your control. But the level of emotion there, you can see how much it means to these guys. Yeah, it, it does mean a lot. I mean, they prepare you know, yeah. for months in advance before we even get started in this championship. And Longay is someone who's been part of it for such a long time. He's had many teams uh, that he's been a part of, but definitely teams at home at Ferrari. Mm -hmm. um, we saw how together they were after the incident had occurred. Um, he himself, like Claire so rightly said, how can you control the uncontrollable? You just simply can't. Um, in terms of where he sits pace-wise, there's no disputing it that he is one of the best. I mean, his qualifying has been sensational. Uh, just to get a front row lockout at Zandvoort, we haven't seen front row lo lockouts like that at all through the course of this championship. So Ferrari have done something that many others haven't been able to do. It's just those little errors that come in that aren't necessarily their fault, but you know, sometimes upset their races, but they can look ahead to event three. I have no doubt they're going to be preparing hard, ready for the next one. And uh, I'm sure they'll be wearing their hearts on their sleeves as they make their way forward. Who knows? Long game might, might stir up some trouble when we head into event three. Well, I look forward to seeing how he bounces back. But as we wrap up event two, who is your driver of the whole event? Oh, I could say, I've got mine. I've got mine. Well, you went with Freddie Rasmussen last time. I thought you're probably going to go with Freddie Rasmussen again. I could either be really mean oh, to you right on, now Hayden. and come steal on. it. Come on. And I am because it's the right choice. You know, dominant drive on the final day. Freddie Rasmussen, well, can't three commentate, wins. Can't no, commentators no. unite. You've got another <laughs> else in a minute. We're a team, man. <laughs> we are a team. But you now need to think of another name. Yeah, Freddie Rasmussen, fine performance across the event. Three race wins dominating the championship. 41 points is a huge gap to go into the final event, but we've seen from Thomas Ronha how quickly that can change. So he yeah. needs to keep up that consistency going into event three. I wish I had a teammate like Barry Burrow, man. I have to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, incredible. Um, no, I'm, uh, do you know what? I, I'm going to say off the back of achieving a pole at uh, the USGP, appreciate he didn't win, but I'm going to give Lucas Blakely uh, a bit okay. of a head, head tip. Maybe as well, Brendan Lee. As well, I'm going to throw two in, seeing as you took Rasmussen. So, yeah, Brendan Lee taking his first podium. Fantastic to see Blakely with the pole. I, I think was brilliant. Okay, well there you have it. So many strong results across the field over event two. A dominant weekend for Freddie Rasmussen. Congratulations to him for his victories and to all of our winners. There will be a link posted into the chats now. It's a survey link. We want to know what you have thought of event two. Tell us how you're feeling, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you want to see next time. And we'll do our best, of course, to continue improving the coverage that we bring to you. Thank you so much, Hayden, George and Claire, for keeping me company over the last few days. Six races, three days. It has been a lot of emotion, a lot of excitement and a lot of chaos. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you to all of the production team that have made this happen. Wouldn't have been possible without you all. And thank you guys for joining us at home. That is all. That's us signing off from Event 2. for Fasty, who will go up to the line. He takes P3 for Freddy Rasmussen. 13 races now, unlucky number, maybe for some, not for the Great Dane. Round 10, 10, they go, wheel to wheel, they make contact, but it's Alfie Butcher, the Challengers champion, a debut victory here for the young man. Incredible, what a performance. The two-time champion rises once again for the first time this season. It's another race win. It's 10 race wins in F1 Sim Racing history for Jarno Opnir, Barry Burrowman for the lead of the race. Coming through the final few corners. What a way to win at Spa. But Blakely coming back. He's not letting it go. Contact as they make their way out. But for the second time here in Belgium, it's Barry Burrowman who takes a sensational victory. And there we go. Thomas Ronhard, not his day today. Massively upset with that one. Nicholas Longe, he did select the dry tyres, but the game gave him the inters. So he's not going to be happy about that one. But really unfortunate 
for Nicholas Longe, and I'm sure Ferrari will be massively, massively annoyed with that. Freddy Rasmussen getting the jettison out of these final corners now. He's going to look to round turn 13 very soon to be. Turn 14 alike. The Red Bull giving him wings once again, and it's double Dutch Grand Prix delight for Freddy Rasmussen. The Great Dane scores his second victory of the season. Longe, I mean, just look at that. It almost breaks your heart to see it, really.